back. Well, here we go, everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon for those of you on the East Coast. We got to listen to a little bit of music, and I cut it off before the end because on that particular song, I don't know what they were doing, but they go into the Wawas, if anybody knows that song and understands how far it goes. But anyway, hey, my name is Samuel Sweet. I am a third-generation insurance director, and we are going to play my game today, which is we're going to go through the script we're going to go through detail by detail, matching everything we've learned so far and everything we've seen on the video with Ashley Rust and kind of stitch it all together to say to ourselves, holy mackerel, this is what actually happens whew, when I meet with a client. But as we do every single morning, I always like to get a little pump up. I actually didn't work late. I only worked till seven o'clock last night. So it was a great day for me. I'm awake, but I need the energy and I know all of you are going to give it to me. So here we go. New agent onboarding class 23-016, otherwise known as 23-16. How are we doing this morning? We're great. Hey. Good morning, everybody. Hey. Um, I love it. I love it. Thank you so much. It helps me. Trust me. It helps me a lot uh, to get that feedback from you or at least get that early morning uh, kind of jolt because <clears throat> I don't mainline anything. So your energy is what gets me going. All right. So as we do every single morning, we talk about what we did yesterday. First of all, uh, did anybody see the meme I had up there? Anybody see the meme? Okay. Jama Jama Jay. Jamelia, no, Jamila. Good morning. Good morning. How do you say your first name again? Jamela. Jamela. Okay, so Jamela, have you ever worked in the corporate world? Um, no. No. Okay, so in the corporate world, they have this thing called KPIs, Key Performance Indicators, right? Oh no, did my fan die? No, oh, there we go. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with a key performance indicator because it tells us kind of where we're at. It gauges us as far as you know how close are we to go whatever that is and that's really fine but it doesn't help the individual aspect, right and i've been in my life why am i getting feedback? uh jamal can you yeah it's your microphone getting feedback anyway so what i was saying is that i believe in the human factor so kpi Keep people involved, keep people involved, keep people involved, keep people involved, right? But also keep them informed, interested, and inspired. Because if you don't do all four of those things, your key performance indicators or how well you're measuring your business will invariably go down. So that's why I love that particular meme. Amanda, your hand is raised right from the word jump. So I'm worried. Oh, there it goes and went away. Wayne, your hand is raised. Right from the word jump. Is that intentional? Do you have a question? Nope, that went away. You asked, okay. You asked who saw the thing. And so rather than interrupting, we just raised oh, our hands. I asked who saw it. Okay, I'm with you. Thank you so much. All right, let's go to Brooke because she's laughing at me as usual. I am making a fool out of myself. Let's try again. Brooke, did you have an opportunity to work with your hierarchy yesterday? Yes, sir. Uh, we watched a presentation from Ashley and a presentation from Torian as well. Ooh, from Torian as well. He's the guy who went through this course and he's done exceedingly well. So where was the Ashley presentation live? Yes. Okay, so walk me through that presentation. Um so she started I didn't I got there a little late because I was watching Torian's. But okay, so walk me through walk me through Torian's then if you watch that whole thing. Let's go. Okay, so Torian started off with um, had he had a lot of technical difficulties getting the lady on the Zoom, but he was very patient with her, very 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 patient with her, and he ended up helping her get on her Zoom call. Actually, I think he used Google Meet, but he had to share the screen. I know this isn't like super important, but it is because it taught me a lot of patience yesterday. Um, she was she was an older lady, uh, and she ended up. Getting on the call, finally, she kept trying to interrupt him, but he <laughs> kept it on the track very well. Like, he was nice. He was kind the whole time. He never wavered from his kindness. But mm -hmm. he, um, he, anytime she he, she would say something about, oh, you see what's going on around me? He would just be like, yeah, I see that. Okay, now uh, back into the presentation. He, like, did really good with that. Okay. He, began, uh, he began with the A1 statement, but he really, he didn't have to do a bunch of that because he was already talking to her 
so Thanks. much to get her on the thing. So he had a lot of rapport already built with the lady. Did um, he sell her? Say that again. Did he sell her? So he did sell her, but he couldn't get her. She could not get back into her email. He was on that call till nine o'clock at night trying to get her to sign <laughs> email to sign the. Um, okay, so what did he sell her? Do you know? Yeah, he sold her just the in, the recommended program, and um, how much was that? It was a hundred and eighty-two, I think. Oh my goodness! So one hundred eighty-two dollars times twelve is equal to two thousand one hundred eighty-four. If you had sold that, how much would you've gotten in your bank account next Friday? Um, I think it is it fifty percent to start off with. Well, multiply twenty one eighty four. You get fifty percent credit, so that's going to equal one thousand ninety two. But you have to multiply that by seventy five percent, right? Oh, so because you get the full. What? You, so what happens when you're a agent in trading, which you all are now? You're on a fifty percent contract. Anything that you sell uh, within your first ninety days, or your first fifteen thousand dollars of ALP is at fifty percent credit, and then you get. 75% advance. Okay, the other 25% you don't get because that pays the essays, the trainer, stuff like that. Okay. Once you're either hit 15,000 or you're over 90 days, you go to a 60% contract and you get 100% of your advance, 60% up front and 40% on the back end, like two, three months later. Okay. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I think it was a little lower than 182 because he said he was going to get like seven. But um, that okay. might have been after his sell was 182. Okay. So how many referrals did he collect? Again, he did not get any because she could not get back into her contacts. He kept telling us, like, usually I get five to ten. Mm -hmm. Usually. Uh, and she he had people, but she couldn't get back in to get the numbers. So it was probably, I think she had. Was she on her phone the whole time? Yeah. Well, there you go. Right. So 70% of our presentations are done on a cell phone. Isn't that bizarre? So I want you to think about this for a second. We sold $17 million in July. So I'm not the brightest guy. Let me do my math. 17 million times 0.7 is equal to $11.9 million. So basically $12 million in the month of July was sold via the phone. I don't know about you, but that's, that's, an, that's crazy. In the insurance world, that's crazy. Because yeah, insurance for years, you're always in the house sitting down, so you can only move so fast. Now, literally, as much as you want to work, you can work. Yeah. That's why the opportunity is unlimited, and we don't put a cap on how much you can make. So I'm just going to let you know, I probably, if I were in production, I wouldn't go full out every single day. That's just not me. Okay? But what I probably would do is I would say, okay, well, I want to make X amount of money in... July as a push month. So I'm going to go all out in July and then I'm going to take it a little easier in August. So you end up doing this in terms of your comp, you go up and you go down, but that's me. That's what I want to do. You have the ability to do whatever you want. You can go a full mail or a, you know, against the wall all out and make as much money as you want and then take, you know, the next month off or the next quarter or, or whatever you want to do. If you're going to do it for a whole year, it's entirely up to you. But keep in mind, you're going to have some challenges. Like we saw Torian had a challenge, right? He had to talk to an older lady. She didn't have all the information. She this, that, or the other. He still persevered. And that's great. Walk me through. So you jumped in the middle of Ashley's presentation. What happened there? Um, with Ashley's presentation, she just walked him through all the veteran benefits, um, which they did enjoy. The, the husband ended up also having a hearing issue so he couldn't hear everything okay. um, he was uninsurable because he already was disabled okay. but the uh, wife was not uninsurable so she ended up um going through everything with her she was almost 80 years old though so she, she was 79 next month so she had one more month before she was or one more year after her birthday and Ashley tried to explain that to her but she she got upset because she wanted to talk to her husband who couldn't hear anything. And she kind of cut Ashley off at the end and didn't want to um, okay. move forward. That happens. So 
How many referrals did she get? She got, I think she got two kids, a neighbor. She just kept writing any, she just kept asking personal questions and every personal, like what's going on with that person? What's going on with that person? And she probably, I think she, she might've got like seven. So there you go. Even though one person was uninsurable and the other one wasn't interested or cut her off or whatever, she still had a successful client engagement because she got referrals and referrals turn into money because they close at a higher level with higher ALP. So that's great. Oh, and Ashley probably was super nice, right? On the phone or yeah. on the Zoom. Oh, Ashley was so nice the whole time. It didn't matter if that lady, that lady kept telling her like at the end, like, well, basically she didn't, she didn't want to listen to anything else. And she was like, well, what was it beneficial to you? Cause there's like a survey at the end, I guess that you're supposed to give to, and um, she she was still like she wanted she had already told her she was about to hang up and Ashley just kept going and she was like well I, I just want to at least do this survey real quick with you because I'll get in trouble if I don't is what she said uh, and she was like, okay and she I mean she had already spent an hour on the phone with the lady so I guess you know if you spend an hour on the phone with somebody they're gonna still accept a couple more minutes um, and she answered the survey with good great p- feedback even though she was tired of being on the phone she was like have sure. have I um, cordial or something was the question and she was like yeah you've been great and mm-hmm. was the information helpful and she said yes the information was still helpful even though she clearly did not she was not happy about the paying for the end because she was asking a lot of questions about what they already might have had in sure. her answer or we don't you we're trying to let you know this information is so that you know that you don't have much through the VA and you need to go ahead and get coverage. Exactly. And she wasn't happy about that. And probably if her husband could hear, he would have told her, you probably still need to get coverage. But he he couldn't hear anything. And she okay. needed to. No worries. So, so it was successful in the sense that Ashley was able to get referrals. And she took care of his family and gave him the no-cost benefits, right? Did anybody yeah. else? Uh, mm-hmm. Let me ask someone else, Brooke, because you're on a roll. So let's... Uh, <laughs> Let's go to anybody else. Who, uh, let's see, Rebecca Rice, did you get a chance to work with your upline yesterday? Um, I, actually, I did not. Did you do the phone training? I did not. You did not. Were you not available for it or? No. Okay. So when you have that situation, do you let them know that, hey, I can't do this today because I got personal things I got to take care of? Yeah, I told Leo that I wasn't. Okay, to perfect. Do Awesome. That's all I'm looking for. Andrew Fisher, did you get a chance to work with your hierarchy yesterday? Yes, I did. Okay. And I didn't watch <laughs> any. Draw it out of you. Huh? Sorry, I didn't watch any presentations. Um, they had a couple, but they ended up not showing for them. Um, observed a couple of phone calls. Just went over the phone script, and we're going to start dialing today. Ooh, you're actually going to dial leads today. Yes. All right. You looking forward to it. Yeah, got to start sometime, you know? Absolutely. Got to start the job, right? A little fear spike the first time someone answers. But after that, it's like, yeah, okay, I just go through this. Virginia Robertson, did you get a chance to work with your upline yesterday? Yes, we did. Um, we did uh, just voice training, you know, call training. You did phone training. Okay. So uh, are you released to call clients yet? Hoping so, but I haven't heard anything. Doing my best. Okay. okay, awesome. We'll do it later today. That's great. David Stokes in the dark. David, did you get a chance to work with your hierarchy yesterday? Yeah, we just had like a, a brief meeting, um, like to int- to introduce, but that was it. Like that was our first time actually interacting with the hierarchy yesterday at all this week. Who was the hierarchy, or who is your hierarchy? Sal. Sal Sortino, right? Or Sorvino? Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. He, uh, the issue with Sal is that he's more of a recruiter. So he finds people like you and then he puts them into the program. You're going to work with uh, Walter Henderson, I think, and Sam C. Exactly. Okay, perfect. Let's see. One more person. Now we're going to go with Eric because he's drinking. So I like that. Eric, did you get a chance to work with your upline yesterday? Yeah, uh, I was actually in the same group group as uh, Brooks. I saw Ashley do a presentation. I saw Tori okay. do a presentation. Um, good stuff. A lot of uh, difficulty with you know getting people on the on the calls. It's yeah, it's a bit of a challenge um, sometimes. Totally understand. Is there anything that you saw either one of them do that you don't think or that you think is challenging for you? 
Uh, no, it seemed like they they follow the the script pretty pretty soundly. So as long as you have uh, the script very memorized, um, it's easy to like just jump back onto it. That's what a lot of Torian did was like uh, his uh, his client would keep on like getting distracted, like Brick was saying, and then he would just like jump back to his uh his little jump back points to his uh, to the script in order to get back on track. Okay, very awesome. Funny, of course. It was a good experience for you then. All right, yeah. perfect. I have 13 of you that have submitted the DRB report and there are 25 of you in this room. So there's 12 of you that haven't done it. Corollas, are you there? Dylan Baker says he's sick. Faith Webb, are you there? There she is. Hi, Faith. Corollas, Corollas Kokar, are you there? Bum, bum, bum. No Corollas. All right, everybody, uh, please submit your DRB. Okay, the last person that submitted the DRB was Wayne Butler. Corollas submitted it, so he's good to go. And we still only have 13. So the people I have are Wayne Butler, Benjamin, or Ben, Heidi, Amanda, Adam, Kristalina, Corollas, Keaton, Rebecca, Faith, and Andrew. If I didn't call your name, I do not have your submittal yet, okay? I sent mine in right before the class started. <clears throat> Melissa? Yes, yeah, sorry, Melissa. In before yeah, the I class sent mine started. in too. I see you, Melissa. Yeah, I got yours, Melissa. Okay. I'm sorry. Thank Who you. else was that? Jam Jamil Jamila? Yeah, I sent mine in. You didn't get it? I sent mine in as well. Ba -ba -ba -ba. So I'm going to list the names again Dylan, James, Wayne, Ben, Heidi, Amanda, Adam. Eric, David, Kristalina, Corollas, Keaton, Rebecca, Faith, Andrew, Virginia, and Melissa. There are two Rebecca's. Can you specify which Rebecca? Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, Rebecca Rice. Okay. And, and Rebecca LaFontaine. Lafont oh, my gosh. LaFont LaFontaine. Lafonte, thank you. Bum, 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 bum. Niall sent us in, Jason sent us in. After you submit it, you will see. Yeah, after you submit it, you'll get a confirmation email from JotForm saying that you submitted it successfully. If you don't get that email, it means for whatever reason it didn't go through, okay? All right, so today, what are we doing? It's Thursday. It's kind of moving day. We're going to go through the script. And I'm going to show you how I navigate HP Pro at the same time. Are we up for that? Everyone excited? No, no one's excited. They're like, oh my God, the script. But I'm going to walk through. If you have a question, raise your hand. But I'm not going to do it like a presentation. I'm going to do it as if I'm training. So I'm just going to walk through pieces. I'll talk about pieces and I'll just keep going. If you are confused or have a question, I need you to raise your hand because. That way I can stop, okay? But we've got to get through the script today. This is the presentation script. This is attachment four, known as the veteran presentation. All right, so give me a second. Let me turn off my key performance indicators. Let me go to, well, let me do HP Pro first. So I can have that up and running. At least that's over there. And let me bring up my scripts. And number four, the veteran presentation. There it is, comes up, that's perfect. And now I'm gonna share my screen. So I can find myself, there we go, share my screen. Nope, share that one. And it should say Google up there, perfect. And I have my first question with my next agent in training in about 13, 14 years. Okay, Faith, what can I do for you? Do you want us to follow along in HP Pro as well or just watch what you're doing? Well, so, <laughs> You, either way, it's up to you, but what I'm going to do is walk through everything and it, 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 yeah, don't enter any information I'm entering in. Just follow along until you can't do it anymore. It, how do I explain this? Just follow along. If you want to, you can be in your own stuff, but what I'm not going to do is wait for you to fill in information to catch up. Does that make sense? This is just kind of a walkthrough to see behind the scenes. Is that fair? Okay. All right, so first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna log in. By the way, I have my script up, so I'm ready to go. It's right there, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and log in with my username. So I'm not having, the Zoom is like in one minute. So I'm ready to, I'm preparing myself to get ready for the Zoom. So I'm gonna say it's my name. 
I'm going to log in. And now Zoom is up. I am here. I'm going to click on Launch HP Pro. Now, if I know who the client is, I'm going to put the client name in here. Since I can't, I'm going to go ahead and do the others. I'm going to do other, wait for it to pop down, click on other. All this comes up, state of California, presentation type is going to be veteran, and I am going to choose the return card and the SG numbers, SGMA D. Okay, so there it is. So I'm not going to click this button until I'm ready to start. Okay, I suggest that you click it once your client is on Zoom. You haven't shared your screen yet, but now the presentation starts. This way you get an accurate time of how long it takes you to get through Zoom. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and click on start presentation. And now it's sitting there. What I, I don't know why it does this for me on my screen. Why is it doing that every single time? So I'm going to click on display because this is the first thing that the client's going to see, correct? So that's sitting there ready to go. The client now jumps on Zoom and I say, hey, how you doing? Glad to see you, glad to see you. How was everything going? Melissa, can you turn your camera back on even though you turned it off? I mean, I'm just kidding, right? I'm just saying, I'm gonna find a way to build rapport with the client, one way or the other. And then I'm gonna, myself, I'm gonna formally say, hey, my name is Sam Sweet. I'm a, a director with uh, American Income Etc. 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 Give my personal value statement. And I'm going to say, is this the first time someone's met with you virtually or on the, uh, in person? And they're going to say, absolutely. And I'm going to say, great. Do you get very involved with your VFW because it's a return card? And they're going to give me the answer. And then I'm going to say, hey, when we forward, lower my voice and say, as one say as one veteran to another, I know we don't hear this enough. Thank you very much for your service to our country. And then I'm going to wait for them to say thank you. Sometimes I see new agents just kind of go through it quickly. Don't do that. Let them respond because they almost invariably will thank you for thanking them. All right. So that gets me through the first part. Then I'm going to say right here, a copy of the letter. What I'm going to do is share my screen. Let me know when you can see it. Do not tell them you're turning your camera off. Just say, I'm going to share my screen and then turn your camera off and then share your screen so that it looks like that's the way it's supposed to work. Because if you do it the other way, then people like some people I've seen it where clients will say, well, what happened to your camera? And now you have to explain kind of what's going on or whatever the case may be. Either way, turn your camera off. Okay, so right here. All right, then the next thing you do is say, hey, this is a copy letter that you received. So now I'm coming over here and I'm showing this letter. I could make it bigger if I wanted to. I can keep it small. It doesn't matter unless the client wants you to do something differently. So it's up to you. And then you just read, hey, the veteran service organization got together and those some common concerns shared by all veterans. And my job is really simple, one, two, and three. And then at the end, there's going to be a report four that goes back to the VSOs so they know I went over everything with you and got you enrolled today. Virginia Robertson, what can I do for you? Can I help you find the mute function on Zoom? If you can hear me, Virginia, you still need to unmute yourself. <laughs> it's fine. We'll get by the end of two weeks, you'll know how to unmute. Okay, so um when you said to turn off your camera, sorry, I was trying to find the reaction button. Um, when you say that to turn off your camera so that you can then flip your screen, when we watch that other woman do her presentation. Uh -huh. There was still a little tiny picture of her in the upper right. So That's right. If we turn off our video, then they won't see our little face in the right hand corner. Is that a right? Corner? But they'll see. Can you see my face? Yes. Okay. So when I go to, and I turn my camera off, uh, when I turn my camera off, this is what they see. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's whatever I put into my profile picture for Zoom. Now, the reason that Ashley doesn't turn her camera off is she's been doing it for a number of years. She's completely comfortable looking into the camera, having a conversation, looking away. She, that's fine. New agents usually are challenged trying to do that because what they're trying to do is follow a script that they just learned. They're trying to navigate through HP Pro with all that information, and they're trying to make sure that Zoom is working. So what they invariably end up doing is they look away and they never have a conversation directly into the camera. So what we found is that if you just turn your camera off, 
for a new agent, your close rate goes up by 25% because you're not killing your credibility by not paying any attention to the camera. Now, you don't have to turn your camera off. You don't want to once you're released. But in this class, I want the camera off because I know you're going to do better if people aren't watching you fumble around, trying to read something, trying to navigate. Does that make sense? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Amanda, what can I do for you? Okay. Um, I have two questions. So if they are looking at this um, and you can make it bigger. And so if they complain about eyesight or I can't see it, you can zoom in so that they don't do they just see the letter or do they see the entire screen like we are seeing your entire screen right now? You are seeing exactly what the client sees. Okay, so we could zoom in so they're not seeing the side bars of all of well, that. No, no, you. it doesn't matter if they see this. This is fine because you're gonna go through all this information. What I talked about zooming in was zooming into the letter itself like that. Yeah. Okay, I just meant the people with bad eyesight that it's already hard enough for them to see and read on their cameras or phones, let alone something that okay. small. So, yeah. so here's a trick, okay? Most people will not read what you're showing them anyway. And we're not reading it out loud because that's not written in the script, is it? No, this is not written in the script. So all you need to do is show this to them Mm -hmm. And then you're reading exactly what's in the script. Okay. okay. And then um, another question. I know this will be hopefully uh, working with people all over the country, not just our state. But if we are talking to someone in our state, our resident producer state, um, and they are within driving distance, are we allowed to do in-person presentations? Yes, you are. However, uh, we'll talk about that next Tuesday about how I want you to do if you're going to do an in person presentation, how I want you to do it. Okay, because it's a bit different. And then other questions. Sorry. Um, for okay. the picture in the corner, would it be good to obviously use the same photo from our credentials that we'll be submitting? Yes, I would. Um, I would. Yeah. Or should it just be the same photo like you have, or should it be the actual picture of the credentials, including the photo in it? No, it should be a picture of you, not your credentials. I mean, okay. I, I used to use my badge picture, just so you know, when you order your badge, your picture is yes. on it. And it says you could use that as well. It's just that I work all over the place. And so it's better just to have my brand be my picture of myself. You, it, okay. It's entirely up to you which way you want to go. Oh, I think it's nice that it's personal. It doesn't look like just an agent, but it's still professional. So I think it's good. I just didn't know if it needed to be our credentials. That's all. Oh, Thank you. Totally fun. Okay. Hold on one second. I have emails going out all over the place. I have agents freaking out. Okay. So we have that part done. Then I said we went through the script. So we're right here. And I just said at the end, there's a report form that goes back to VSO. So they know I went through everything and got you enrolled today, right? Now we're going to ask this question. Do you know why the VSOs want to ensure you're enrolled today? Personally, I closed this letter. It's up to you. You don't have to, but I do because there's no point in showing the letter anymore, right? So now I've got to read the rest of this. Do you know why? Whatever they tell you, yes, no, and I give you a reason, you just say exactly. Number one, they want to ensure staying care of. Number two, ensure all other veterans get a chance to be seen. Now, the good news is nothing for you to write down or memorize, so sit back and enjoy the show, okay? That's how I do it. So you can use these words exactly right here. Again, this is a map. It is not written in stone, although some of your leaders may tell you read it and memorize it word for word and say exactly that. The closer you stick to the script, I guarantee you, the better you're going to do. So now it's the last will and testament preparation survey. So what you say is, let's start with the quick survey. Okay, can you see it on the screen? So I'm going to come over here and the LWTPS is the survey. So when I click on it, when I try to click on it, this will come up. This is the LWTPS or the last will and testament preparation survey for veterans. Okay. Then the script tells us, okay, well, start at the beginning of the survey, fill out every field based on the client's responses, and then it talks about VA life insurance coverage. So let's just do it together so you can see, for those of you who had to remember from Ashley's video, we're going to pick household type. In this case, it's going to be married. I'm going to say they belong in the military. 
they received an honorable discharge and they don't have to come down here into asking again on whether or not you received a, a discharge of honorable or general under honorable conditions. So in this case, it's going to be yes. And if I was in a war or I'm sorry, the client was in a war campaign or expedition, in this case, I'm going to say yes. The war service was, hmm, war service was what? I don't know. Where could it be? Where could it be? It would be in Europe. Okay. Rank of discharge was, I'm going to say staff sergeant. If I can find it, there it is, because we're actually using me. And now this is the VA insurance coverage. So this is where we're asking this question. Have you been able to enroll into your veteran life insurance? And if the answer is yes, we say, okay, great, which one? Because when you click on here, there are two of them. One is the Veterans Group Life Insurance, and the other one is the Veteran Affairs Life Insurance. Hold on one second, Melissa. So Veterans Group Life Insurance is where you transition your service members group life insurance into veterans. So when you got out of the service, you transition that. If you didn't do that, you still have the ability to get insurance through the VA. It's called Veteran Affairs Life Insurance. It's a little bit different, but you can still do it. So we're asking which one. Invariably, we'll get told no coverage. But if they pick one or the other, no problem. Just choose the one that they tell you. Melissa, what can I do for you? So, and I'm just asking because I know, for example, my husband, he served in two different um, two different combats, two different countries. Um, he was a different military rank on each one. So if that comes up, and they say something like that. Oh, hold on a second. So he only has one rank at discharge. Okay, that's why I was asking the question. Well, the question is not about what rank you were at the time of the war. And in your case, if you have somebody like your husband, you just say, what was the last one? Okay. You were. Okay. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So now we we're going to go through here and we're going to do the client information. So again, I'm going to go with the singer. He's going to be Tom Jones. His birthday is 0101-1990. His gender is male. It's going to ask, do you have any adult children or dependent children? So adult children, you can fill this out right here with their email address and all of that. So let's just go ahead and do that. His name is Sean. His last name is Jones. And his birthday, remarkably enough, is exactly the same. How is that even possible? No spouse, no last name, email address. We need the email address, right? So we're going to say john at gmail.com. And the phone number is crucial because it's the only way we can get in contact with them. So we need to put something in here. The city is San Jose in this case, and the state is absolutely crucial because the state will tell us whether or not, uh, well, if you don't have the state, then you don't know if you can sell to them because you're licensed by state or by province, okay? So we're gonna pick California, and we're just gonna follow that up with the zip code. Now we're done, we'll click save. Now I have an adult children that gives you the number that you filled out. Tom is married to Helen. Can you believe it? Helen Jones, because you know it's a British name, 01-01-1991, just to make it a little bit different. I'm gonna say female. There is no dependent children in this particular case. And then we go to Tom's employment. So Tom works full time. He does sales in his annual income. See, now it asks for annual if you do the survey. We're gonna see what the impact is when we get to the needs analysis screen. In this case, he makes $110,000 a year. Helen is employed full time as well. Helen is a engineer. Nah, I will just say she's a manager, but Helen makes all the money. She makes 250,000 a year. Now we come to the insurance, okay? So on the script, now we've gotten through this, you know, so I don't tell you a bunch of other stuff. I just expect you to get through it. Now on the insurance, break down the various insurance coverages through work and outside of work. So we're looking here and all we have to do is click anywhere in here and it comes up with the bigger look at the screen. So what we want to know, WHL is whole life term and accidental death benefit. Again, later today, I'm going to go through all the policy information or the product information for American Income Life. So in this case, I'm just going to put zero, okay, just because I don't want to go through all of this and try to, to I just want to put zeros. But if somebody were to say, well, I have 25,000, you could ask, is it whole life or term? But here's the interesting point for all of you, and you might want to note this. If you have insurance through work, it should be treated as term. And the reason I say that is because once you leave your job, 98% of everybody who has insurance through work will lose that coverage because it's typically a group life policy. 
and the group is the pool of employees. So the moment you are no longer part of the group or go no longer an employee, <clears throat> you're not going to be covered by that policy typically. Now, if you work for the state or you work for the city or some type of a government official, usually what will happen is they will allow you to transition that group life policy into some type of or into your permanent policy. You could do that, but the price is significantly higher. In most cases in group life, they're either covering the expense 100% uh, or in part, some percentage of it. If you talk to somebody who's like a manager or senior guy like me in various companies, we will probably have insurance that's paid for by the company. And that's okay if they tell you that, just put the information in here appropriately. And then outside of work, <clears throat> same concept here, you wanna ask, do you have any permanent insurance through a third party? You want to know that, okay? Now, the question here in, this, in the scripts is, you know, who do you have your private life insurance through? The reason we have you ask that is not because we really care. It's because when they say, oh, it's with State Farm or it's with Farmers Insurance or it's worth New York Life or whatever, what we want you to say is, hey, that's great. I'm glad you have that. It's a good company. Never disparage a competitor in any way, shape, or form. It's the same concept as when you go to interview for a new job and you say, man, the last guy or the last woman I work for is horrible. That's why I'm leaving is a lousy company. What do you think the interview thinks of that statement? They're going to think negatively because they're going to assume that you're going to get disgruntled and say the same thing about them. So there's no point. There's no upside to you to uh, disparage other companies. OK. Now, if they have other, co so you can ask if they're five, 10 or 20 year term, it makes it sound like you have some knowledge of their insurance coverage. Now in yellow, I said, if they have other policies, be prepared to spend the insurance. This is an important concept for you because let's say that this guy, Tom, has $50,000 of term through the company. In my mind, there's two things I'm gonna do. Number one, I'm gonna point out that, hey, when you leave that company, it's gonna be gone. That's one thing. But if you die while you're still an employee, yes, Julie's going to get paid out, but you aren't going to only want to cover $50,000. If you have a house, if you have uh, kids and you have something you have to do, if you have, like I said, the mortgage experience, if you have anything else where you want to leave benefits for your children or your wife or your husband that is greater than 50000 then 50000 is not enough. So whenever I talk to people, I usually look at the need, right? I'm trying to understand what I think they possibly would need. So let's say in this case, I'm talking with Tom over a period of time. I finish this, I get through everything, and now we're talking about the needs analysis. I will remember that Tom has a policy for $50,000. When I look at his need, I may determine, hey, Tom, based on the fact you have a half million dollar home, that's 500,000. And the fact that your wife says she wants to stay in it, for until she dies, if you die tomorrow, she's only getting 50,000 of which 20,000 is probably gonna be spent immediately for your funeral fund expenses, that leaves her with $30,000, right? If she can't work or she doesn't work or something like that, she only has $30,000 to spend, the monthly nut on that house and the monthly payment on that house is $2,000. That means she has two years before she has to sell the house. That's how I would spend that insurance. Does that make sense to everybody? Everyone, Virginia, are you tracking with me? Virginia, I can't see you, so you have to say something. <laughs> Virginia? The thing. Hold on. Yes. Okay, you perfect. No, well, I, I have the, when I'm sharing my screen, it's difficult for me to see everybody because I'm all over the place, okay? So now we're at the script. We have actually, we were prepared. We're going to remember if they have insurance. And then we ask them, why did you purchase this insurance? Because we want them to sell themselves. Well, why did you purchase that 50000 Oh, you know, I wanted to make sure I took care of my funeral fund expenses. So now in my mind, I know that this guy believes in insurance, right? It's not a bad thing when somebody has insurance. But I told you Helen has none and Helen makes the most money. Right. So now I'm thinking, well, we got to make sure Helen's on point because she has no insurance anywhere. So if she dies, then Tom is going to be out of luck. And he certainly can't afford to keep that house forever. Right. 
So that's how I save the insurance. I'm gonna click save. And now that part is done right here. I'm gonna move into the banking. And I'm just gonna get that done. Hey, do you have checking and savings account? Yep, how many do you have? Oh, I have two checking accounts and one savings account. Okay, put that in there, put that in there. Good, do you have any investment accounts? Nope, we do not. We live paycheck to paycheck. And I'm thinking, wow, with uh, 360,000, that must be a tough life. Then we look at their property. When I click on anything with the property, this will pop up, okay? And now I just need to fill this in appropriately. So I'm going to say, do you own or rent? We own. How much is your monthly payment? It's $3,000 a month. The mortgage balance is $675,000. So now you see right off the bat, in my head, I'm thinking $50,000 of insurance not going to cover this guy. Right? The rate they got was 2.3, and they have 26 years left. So they just refinanced this thing, or they just bought it. So now I click save, and then I'm going to say, okay, Tom, what funeral instructions do you want? You want to be buried, cremated, or mausoleum? And he's like, oh, I want a mausoleum, but uh, the wife's not going to pay for it, so I'll just do a straight burial. I'm like, okay, cool. And then I ask her, and she goes, oh, no, I'm getting a mausoleum if I die because I make the most money. I'm like, okay, that's cool. And then where do you want to be buried, national, state, or private? They both want to be in private. So now I believe I've got this all done. It's all filled out and ready to go. Now up here in this upper right hand corner, I could click on that if I wanted, and it's a message from the service members benefits organization. So let's click on it and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Lord Clapham, founder of America Wills. Congratulations on taking this step to plan your future. A will is a legally binding document that allows you to control what will happen after you pass away. We have partnered with American Income Life Insurance Company to walk you through how to complete the survey, questionnaire, and issue your will kit. Please take a minute to complete the report form as this information helps us serve our customers more effectively. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ward Klopp, I'm founder of American okay, well, Congratulations on taking Thank you. So you could play that video if you want. Uh, anybody watched Ashley and Torian? Did they play that video? Just speak out because I can't see you. No. Did they play the video? No. So you don't have to do that. You could if you want. It just depends. I personally don't play that video because I already have them in the Zoom. I don't need someone else to build my credibility. Right? That's my thought process. So I've come down here. Now I'm at the end. <clears throat> if everything is filled in correctly, maybe there's a note I want to make to myself. So I can click on notes and I can add a note about whatever. Now the client's seen all that, so whatever note you put in there, make sure that they're not gonna get upset with what you're saying. Now I'm gonna click on complete. If I click on complete and I get this, it means that I have missed something. It is telling me that there's a required field that I haven't filled out. And the, when I go and look, I'm like, okay, where it is. So you can see right there's one, highlighted in red on the outside and then yellow. And then I have one right here, red and red. So I didn't fill either one of those out. So are you a current VSO member? Nope, they're not. And then if I scroll down here, they do bank locally for checking and savings. Okay, so let me try to do complete one more time. Ooh, I'm still missing something. Where could it possibly be? Where could it possibly be? I'm trying to find something. Oh, VSO membership, not a member. I think that covers it. Let's see. All right, now that covers it. Then you have a button that says save and exit and view recommendations. Please do not click on view recommendations. Please do not click on it because if you click on it, it does this. It comes up and it says, hey, we need to issue the family information guide, the no cost legal will kit and complete your family insurance needs analysis. So we're doing that anyway. Telling them we're gonna do that at this point in time really doesn't help. But then we get this thing that says survey considerations. Uh oh, what does this mean? Let me ask uh, Melissa, what the heck does this mean? Uh, based on their income and their life insurance need that they would be negative three. Yeah, they don't, they, so they don't need, need it. <laughs> $3.5 million of insurance is what this is saying. Yeah, yeah. All right. So now let me think about the logic of what we're doing with the client. They called and they asked for uh, the, uh, the two thousand up to four thousand dollar accidental death and dismemberment benefit, and we are going to give that to them. But then we're turning around if we do the survey and we click on recommendations and it says, "Hey, you're short three and a half million dollars." 
Melissa, what do you think the client <laughs> will say if they see this? They're going to say goodbye. <laughs> well, You're crazy. You're crazy. Well, what they'll <laughs> probably do, you're close, but what they'll probably do is ask, what, 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 what does this mean? Yeah. Because in effect, what we've done is we've put the cart before the horse because we haven't talked anything about funeral fund expenses, recommendations from the VSOs, none of that yet, right? Right. None of it. So if we put that in front of a client, immediately the client's going to say, why in the world? What? And now you've built an objection all on your own. So let's not make our job more complicated by putting roadblocks in our own way. So please do not click on view recommendations. It won't help you. All right. So just go in and click on save and exit. Now, when I click on save and exit, all this information that we've entered has now been saved. And it will then be used across the spectrum. Okay, so now I'm here. I've I clicked the complete button on the bottom right, and now I'm going to show the AD and D certificate. So I'm going to come over here. I'm going to click on this thing right here, which is the AD and D certificate. There it is. Now, if I'm talking to a client who is a lead, their name will show up here in their own handwriting because we digitally scan every single one of these return cards. It will have the name of the person who's going to be the beneficiary and the phone number, state, and address. It will also tell you how much. You, oh, let's see if I can make this bigger. See right there, it says X. So when you do this for now, just say $2,000. We start at $2,000 for every association, and then every year or two, it goes up. I think California is now at $5,000 where we provide that. So in the case of us practicing or doing the presentation rubric, whatever the case may be, go ahead and uh, use the $2,000, okay? So that letter comes up and now I'm in the script and I'm saying, hey, now this is your $2,000 accidental death and sperm certificate. It's non-contributory and non-participating. You should practice that word, non-contributory, because some people can't pronounce it and they say, oh, it's non-contributing and non-participating, right? So it's non-contributory, which means it's already been taken care of for you. All right, so there you go. And then uh, if it's a return card, which in this case it is, you listed Samuel Sweet, of course, as your beneficiary. Is that the way you like to keep it? Absolutely, you will. And then you say when you get the email, what you're going to send them, there's nothing else you need to do. It's already in effect. Just print and store it and make sure your family knows where to keep it. So when you're done with that, you're going to move to the family information guide. So what you need to do is up here in the upper right-hand corner, you need to click on that down arrow with the line underneath it. And then the things will do that. And then it will come back and tell us where to go. Why can't I see it? Is it? Nope, that's not it. That didn't work. The control J. Control J? Yeah. Oh, thank you. So look at that. So there's the certificate. I learned something new in class today. So now I've got the group A and D and D certificate there. So when I click on it, that's a PDF file. I need to make sure that I have access to it because this yeah, is one of the documents you need to send to a client. Virginia Robertson, your hand is up. What can I do for you? Oh, it doesn't matter. They have them on the shelf. So you're not going to. Oh, oh, you're talking about leaving from Harbor Freight going to work. It doesn't matter. They have. He said they had four. Yeah, guys, please. Okay. So, phone calls in the middle of training. All right, go ahead. What does it mean in the? On the certificate thing where it says, if a PAVIT. Oh, on the script? Is that what you mean? Yeah, where it yeah. says, if a PAVIT. Yeah, hold on. Habit. Let me show it to you. So on H, uh, sorry, I'm going to show you the script. Okay, so what it's saying is, if, uh, mm -hmm. there it is, if PAVIT. PAVIT is a type of lead. PA stands for the name of the company that does our marketing on Facebook and VET stands for veteran. So if it's that particular type of lead, then you can display the $2,000 gift certificate, download it and send it to the client to enter the information. So I'm gonna show you how to do that. A return card is a type of lead where we have a relationship with an association or a VSO. They send the letter out to every member and then the member responds by saying, yes, I do want the accidental death and dismemberment policy, they send that in and that comes directly to us. So that's like one of the best leads. 
and then we have people who are on Facebook just going around and says, hey, are you a veteran? They click yes. And it says, hey, if you're a veteran, you're eligible to receive these benefits, including your no cost legal will kit. Then they click, they give us all their information. That lead then comes into our system and goes to you and it's called PAVET. Okay. So to show you how to do that Pavit lead, so first of all, we talked about this, we downloaded it, right? If it's a Pavit lead, it would look different here than what it looks right now, but you could come down here and find the $2,000 accidental death and dismemberment. Uh, and I'm gonna have to find that for you because I don't see it in here. Probably because it's under, uh, it's a different code, it's under Pavit. So I'll show you that a little bit later, okay? There's a different way that you do that. Okay, so now we're gonna do the family information guide. I'm gonna share it. So that's the very next thing in line after the group AD and D is right there. I'm gonna click on that. Now, when that is there, I say, hey, this is your barrel and kit for veterans. The first section here, and as I'm saying that, I turn the page. The first section here is all the updated contact information and phone numbers for quick access. They want you to have anything in red applies to your VA burial benefits. Then I turn the page. When I turn the page, notice that Tom Jones is right there. And the information from the survey shows he was in the army in Europe as a staff sergeant. Adam, what can I do for you? Yeah, uh, back to the AD and D um, benefit page for the person uh, in the script. It is asking to confirm: Is this still the beneficiary you want to have? Say that's not the beneficiary. Do you just say okay, and then later on change that? Because I know we download that paper. Or is there a way to edit that paper right away? To no, you're not going to edit that paper. What happens is that's still the individual. And then what you want to do is when you sell the insurance, make sure you get the correct name that's going to be here. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, no worries. Ba, 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 ba. All right. So we're here. Do I have any other questions? No. Hold on one second. What's going on? What is going on? Let me mute everybody just for a second. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. We're back. All right, so let's do share screen go back into it. Okay, so we're here and notice that, again, every bit of information came across. However, not every bit of information is actually filled out here. So what you talk about now is, hey, this is important to fill out. They found uh, veteran benefits have not been claimed due to one of three reasons. Then we give them the reason that we say the guide eliminates all three, right? So the first thing we talk about is vital statistics of the veteran. So you're going to click on this pencil and when you do everything that's in gray should be filled out. Okay, we need to fill that out. Say, hey, where were you born? I was born in San Jose. Okay, my email is john at gmail.com. My phone number is 510-555-555. And when you make a mistake like that, it'll show in red because it knows the format that it's looking for is an email and I have a space between the O and the M. So I need to fix it and tab over and now the red goes away meaning i've done it correctly okay the city is san jose the state is california 95136 whoops so now that's filled in once you fill in all of the gray fields within a section i want you to click on the floppy disk and this is really important because if you don't click that floppy disk the information is not saved if for whatever reason HP Pro crashes or something happens and you haven't saved it, you actually will have to start all over again, which will be very frustrating for you and for your client. So if you save it in each section by clicking the floppy disk, then it reverts back to a pencil and it says the data has been saved successfully. Okay, so now we're come down to the spouse vital statistics. Same concept here. We're going to fill in everything. And notice I have to go and grab, whoops, I have to grab this and make sure it's all at lower level. So it's going to be Helen Jones, date of birth and her place of birth. I'll just say, hey, you were born locally as well, San Jose, and click the floppy disk and now it's been saved. Now I'm going to move over to the veteran information. Here, it shouldn't change. It should be the same, but this is a chance for you to confirm it because maybe it has changed. And you just reiterate, hey, when we put in the survey, you were in the Army in Europe and you were staff sergeant, right? Yes, I was. Okay, great. Click that. Then we come to the veterans to be notified. So again, in the script, I am right here entering information for the 
veterans to be notified. But I actually say the words. So the veteran service groups have found that it can be difficult for civilians to work with the VA. So the reason we're getting veterans here is not that we're sponsoring veterans into the program. It's that in the family information guide, whoever's going to take care of their affairs are going to reach out to veterans that they've listed to help them with the VA. Maybe get the flag, get the medals, arrange for the burial in the uh, National was it Arlington National Cemetery, whatever the case may be. It's easier dealing with the VA if you have experience in the military. That's all. So that's why we have it in this particular format. And then we're going to fill that out. So we're going to click on this. And we're going to say, hey, what's their name? And then you're just going to ask. And you're going to say, it's um, uh, Kevin Bacon, because he spent time. And if you click here, it gives you the different options, if you want, of people who were in there. In this case, we're going to say he's a service member. He was in the Army. And we're going to get his phone number. Miraculously, it's the same as everybody else's. And he's local as well in San Jose, California. 95136. Okay. Now, when you fill this out, you can get down to the bottom here. You can fill out four people if they give them to you. If they say, if they just keep giving you veterans, you keep giving them veterans. What I don't want you to do is I don't want you to say, hey, do you have any veterans that you think we should put in here? Don't do that. Remember, you're the one that's in control. This is a requirement of the VSO to fill out. So you're just telling them, hey, we need to put four service members in here. Who's the first one that comes to mind? Pull out your phone. This way they'll be notified should anything happen to you. And you can cl keep clicking that little plus button and keep adding as many as you want. Okay? Don't let the system stop you. If they're giving you names, click the plus button and continue to add. I personally say who's next. Who's next? After I fill somebody in, I'm like, who's next? That's just the word that I use. I keep control and I'm not asking them for it. I'm sorry, I'm not asking you if they want to put somebody in. I'm just saying who is next. Okay. Once you're completely done with that section, you're going to hit the floppy disk. And now that one is done. You're going to go to the next page. And the next page is the persons to be notified. So if we look at the script here, hey, people to be notified. And this is where you say, this is where together... We're going to list the nine people who should be contacted when something happens to you. As you can see, they have us filling four spots for your family and five spots for emergency contacts. So let's see if that's right. Four and five. Now, if I want to add more, I certainly can. There's nothing that's going to prevent me from doing that. I just have to click on the pencil, get the fields to be filled out, and then just click add. So in this case, the main contact is going to be, uh, let's say, a sister. We're going to call her Mary because I'm not very original. Jones, sister, I'm just typing that in. I skip that, skip that. The phone number is going to be the ubiquitous, all fives. This city is going to be, again, San Jose because I am not original. And California, and the zip code is that, okay? If I want it again, I can click on that and add more, but we're going to definitely add something. In the emergency contacts, I say outside of the above family members. This is key outside of the above family members. Sometimes I've heard uh, new agents talking to clients and they'll say, okay, who do you want as merchant contact? And the client gives them the same names that they put above and the agent doesn't even realize it. So these need to be different people. That makes sense, right? Because you are, it makes sense for the client too, because they already have the names and contact information. We need somebody new and different. So <clears throat> if they say, well, we have my kids, it's all done. Okay, well, who else should we contact in an emergency? And they'll say, well, I don't really talk to anybody or whatever they'll tell you. So help them, right? Well, do you go out? Do you shop? Do you say hello to the shopkeeper? Do you go out to dinners or a restaurant that you go to? People that you would want to know if anything were to happen to you. Oh, yeah, I do talk to such and such, or maybe I have visiting angels come and visit me or, you know, help them fill this out because it's for their benefit. Right. All right. So once you have that filled out, we're just going to add emergency contact here. In this case, we're going to go with Samuel Sweet because he is uh, the man. Let's go with that. OK, so you can, so you can type in anything that you want there. Phone numbers, the ubiquitous 555s. And I live in, uh, again, I'm not very original, so San Jose, California, 95136.
Okay, so you can type in whatever you want for the relationship. Now that we have all that done, we've done the emergency contacts, the script is telling us, okay, what do we do? We turn the page, oh, okay. So we turn the page, that means turn the page actually here. So now we're in the financial institutions and then we say, you don't say the word financial institutions, the blue is just the breakup, letting you know we're in a different section. And you say, when you receive the family information guide, you will enter your financial account information. This way your family members knows which accounts to close. You talk about the last will and testament. Do you have one in place? Yes, I do. Great. This is where you can list where your will is located. If they said no, no problem. We're gonna cover that in the next section. And then all your insurance policies go below. Provided you can qualify for affirmative benefits, you can write those in pen, digital accounts, and funeral instructions. Okay, so we're now here. We've gone through this. We're going to turn the page. And when we turn the page, digital accounts, funeral instructions. So I'm going to click the little pencil, but the only thing I can choose is burial, cremation, mausoleum. So what I use, used to do, and you can do it, it doesn't matter how you do it, but what I would usually say is, hey, now that we've kind of gone through this, have you considered getting yourself the mausoleum that you deserve? Or something like that, because what you just want to do is confirm, no, no, I just want to be buried. Oh, okay, great. So we're going to do that there. So you got the burial. And then you say, then you transition right into the freedom of choice, right? So here you are, you've done that. Now you're going to display the freedom of choice. So as they tell you, no, no, I just want to be buried. Then you can say, hey, that's great. Because, and take your cursor and move it right here. Everyone see that? It's tough to read, but it actually has the letters FOC on it. It's a little icon. You're going to click on it and you say the VSOs have set up their freedom of choice. And as you say that, scroll to the bottom because it is incredibly powerful when your name is right here. Otherwise, it just looks like another form. But the moment someone sees like, oh, wow, your name is on there, they pay attention. It's a psychological thing. So now you're saying it takes care of either your bur er blah, 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 your earth, burial, or cremation, most importantly, all the final expenses that come after, quote unquote, the funeral cost. And they're going to have me run through this with you before we wrap up. And then you tell them what we just did. Hey, the funeral or the family information guide is like a roadmap. It's not necessarily for you. It's actually for your family. So when something does happen, they know what to do step by step. And then you're just going to confirm they understood everything you just did. Does that all make sense so far? Cristalina Reyes, ¿cómo estás? What can I do for Good. you? Uh, everything does make sense. Uh, it's just a question. It's probably a silly question. That freedom of choice, even though they don't purchase uh, a policy, they still get that, right? That's no. still, or no? no? No. So look at what the text says right here. The VSO set up the freedom of choice. You can leave the legacy behind for your family instead of a liability. They're going to have me run th through that with you before we wrap up. Because when we transition to the needs analysis or to the letter that they talk about, that's where we move into the permanent benefits. And this is a permanent benefit, but you wanna let them know that it's available if they so choose, okay? Amanda Hakola, what can I do for ya? Hakola. Um, so of course. <laughs> Why do you got to make me look bad in front of everybody? No, I'm just kidding. Oh, cool. Yes, okay. Amanda. What you when you go up through up there where it has the social media information, uh, passwords and stuff, have you ever had people have issues with that? You mean up here? Yeah. When you, yeah, above? But, but, no, I've never had an issue because it's not for me. If you notice, I can't click anywhere. I don't want the information. Oh, okay. All They're right. going to so fill it out when they get the form. That's uh, correct. Okay, great. So if they notice that on the screen and, you know, have any defensives, we can just say, no, that's for you to fill out at home. Like yeah. in the beginning of the text of the script, we say that this whole thing, we're going to fill out together with you and then we're going to send it to you. You can fill out the rest of it. Oh, OK. Yes, yeah. I, that makes sense. I didn't realize that I I saw the part in the script where it says we fill it out together. Like that's a plus. I didn't realize that there was blank spots. Oh, yeah, there's tons of blank spots, so we don't want to fill out. Okay. All right. Yep, and got it. Perfect. Ben, what can I do for you? Yeah, I just had a question. Are we pulling, like, account numbers, credit card numbers here, or are they doing it themselves? Do we – well, we never pull a credit card number. I don't – I'm not sure what you're asking me. Okay, uh, like, for their financial instructions, like how they're going to pay, that's on them, right? Do we have to ask them for that at all? 
Are you talking about if they were to buy the policy from us? 100%, yeah. Oh, yeah. We only do a bank draft and we'll need their account information. But I'm going to walk through all of that next Tuesday when I walk through the actual e-app, which is the application software. Okay, cool. Thank you. No, that's a good question. But yeah, we don't take credit cards and we don't take banking information from an institution that doesn't have brick and mortar. So like Ally Bank, Chime, stuff like that, we won't take. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so now we've gotten through this. Everything looks good. We go here to the script. What does it tell us to do? Blah, 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 blah. Oh, download the family information guide so you can email it to the client once you finish the presentation. All right. So I'm here. I filled it all out. I don't close it yet. I click that little button. And then it does this little spin thing. And then I learned today if I hit control J, right? Control yes. J. Ooh, there it is, the family information guide. But let's look at it to make sure that it's actually the one that I expect to see. Oh, wow, it's on blank. Oh, it's filling in. Slowly but surely, is it filling in? Mm -hmm. Filled in this stuff but it hasn't filled in. Maybe I went too fast. Maybe it's not fully downloaded yet. Save first. Did you save and then download? Maybe you needed to do that. Well, so you mean like that? Dun, 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 dun. Did I download it? Let's see, control J. This is done. Well, what it's supposed to do is download this and have all the information in here, but for some reason, it's not actually doing it. Does the company have IT support for yeah. us? Yeah, well, they when don't you say IT well. support, what do you mean? <laughs> I mean, when we can't do what you're doing, not doing right now. Well, no, no, you're not gonna be able to pick up the phone and call AO and say, hey, this doesn't work. You would let your upline know that, hey, for some reason this isn't working, I don't know why. They don't right, have so a tech support person that is like, this is- like that. No, they do have tech support, but it's never going to be timely. All right, now the family information guide is there. And yeah, see, so I'm having issues maybe because it's fake. But basically, this entire thing would actually be the family information guide with all the information that I entered. So right now, it's getting a, giving us a bit of a hiccup. But trust me, it works. I know it doesn't look like it right now, but it does actually work. So I'll try to figure out why, what I did wrong. Brooke, what can I do for you? Um, mine's not giving me the option to save, but I was wondering if I didn't fill something out on here and it wasn't, or, but I don't think. Well, Brooke, I'm not going to stop for everyone that right now, I'm just going to walk through the entire process. Okay. I, so I, can check in with I, later. I was wondering about the red area. Do we have to fill that out? The veteran what red area down here? Uh, yeah, that. No, because in the script, it doesn't talk about the red area at all, right? It just jumps from digital to funeral to the freedom of choice, and then you're done. Okay. So so they're going to fill out anything down here. Okay. Okay, so once you've downloaded it theoretically and saved it and it actually was populated correctly, you're going to go ahead and click X so that that one closes, and then you're going to come here and go to page six, which says the last will and testament. So the very next thing is the last will and testament. I'm going to click on that, and now this one comes up. Now I'm going to read <clears throat> this here and say, hey, this is your last will and testament. Do you know how much normal cost? And I'm going to go through all of this. I'm going to turn the page. I'm going to verify the information here. So when I go to verify, I can click on that again, and this will show up, and I can add additional stuff. When we watched Ashley do it, she didn't do this. She didn't click on that. So it's okay. It's up to you. I click on it because I want to get every – I want the client <clears> – <throat> to be conditioned to give me every bit of information, if that makes sense. That's my style. I want them to know they have to fill this out with me and everywhere there's a chance for me to fill it out, I want them to get used to filling something out. Okay, because in my mind, I'm trying to get them to answer yes every single time. You're doing this, yes. Here's the thing I need here, yes, yes, yes. So when I get to the closing question, they're actually more likely to say yes. Proven fact, the more you can get someone to say yes in a sales engagement, when you get to the close and ask them to buy something, they're more, they're actually predisposed to say yes than if you didn't do that. Wayne Butler, what can I do for you?
Shouldn't some of this information be populated automatically since we got most of it earlier? Yeah, it is populated. See, this stuff here I didn't enter in. It's already populated. What's not populated is like a middle name, surname, and nicknames. But those are crucial, which is why if you watch Ashley, she doesn't do it. She just go and talks through the issue and never adds anything more in here. But you could if you wanted to. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so when you do the survey, the survey's information flows through all the rest of the documents. What about the mine, uh, the mailing address? Is that considered essential? I'm so sorry. I have no idea who you are. Amanda, I'm sorry. Uh, Amanda, yeah. so what's your question? Uh, what a, It doesn't have the address on there. Wouldn't the mailing address be considered essential to have in there? You're talking about right here? Yeah. But think about, yes, it is essential, but I want you to think about what's happening. We send this document to the client. They fill out the rest of it. Yeah. This document is not the actual will. It's to prepare them so when they go online, they have all the information co-located. Right? Not a legally binding document for them. Do we have to? No, because what happens is once you have this filled out, you send them to this location right here, americawills.com, and you give them this code, and they actually fill out all the information online. It compiles their free will and sends it to them. It's not legally binding until they get that thing certified and witnessed and all that stuff. Okay. Um, the Okay, so if we miss a spot over here, or, you know, for the non-essentials, it's not a big deal because no. they can do it. Yeah. But so are we ever physically mailing them anything or is our no. company ever physically mailing them something? No, 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 we don't mail anything. Why would we? We're going to send them these PDF files. To the Unless email. they order a pod policy at some point, they would get a policy in the mail. Right. If they purchase a policy, then in six to eight weeks, we will uh, mail them to the address of record, their actual policy information. Yes, that is what we do mail. So on the, but we email everything, um, on the other phone script for when we're trying to book appointments, these zoom meetings, mm -hmm. um, and they at, say, one of the responses is to send it in the mail. It's like, yes, I'm going to do that right after that. We're not doing that. We're, or is the assumption that that's an email? The assumption is that is an email. Okay. But it's not legitimately mailing something right after this. No. It, you, so we used to, right? But now we're moved into the digital age. So we're going to email it to them because we have their email address. Okay. All right. I'm just, I just want to clarify. I want to make sure I know everything. Thank yeah. you. Of course. No problem. All right. So now we've walked through the uh, information about the will kit. We give them all of this. We say your free will to be notarized. States, most states require two witnesses that are not named in your will. The reason I included this is because this is yet another opportunity for you to get two additional referrals, right? Because if they're not named in your will and all you ever gave me was family members, you got to give me two other people. They probably will say, well, I don't know. Or sometimes, sometimes they'll say, oh, you know what? I can have Frank and Dave do it. Oh, okay, cool. Let's get Frank and Dave's information. That's it. It's just another method because in my mind, we should be re trying to collect referrals from the moment they're on Zoom until the moment they leave. Yes, Wayne, what can I do for you? Don't we have to tell them that they're referrals or is that automatically, automatic? Uh, I'll show you when we go through the script how they'll know that they're referrals. Okay. okay? So we okay. do tell them and I'll show you how we do that. Okay. All right, so now I'm gonna download the last will and testament kit. Let's see if this one will work this time. So I'm gonna click on that. It's gonna do that little spinning thing. And then at some point it will uh, actually be updated and uh, I can download it, so I have to wait. Now, when this happens, if it takes a while, you just need to fill the time. Hey, we're just waiting for the system to catch up. Oh, okay, there it is. So this one's pretty big, 8.4 point macro. So I click on that. Oh, uh, yeah, so that's filled out. And now look, the first name, there's Tom, there's Jones, right? So now we see it. This is now legit. Now, it will look better than this. For some reason, there's something going on with our system. But even if you sent them this, it didn't look very good. At least it has all the information that they need to be successful to actually get their will kit right there. Okay. 
So, uh, and I'm saving this into a certain locale. And I told you the way that I save everything is I put the date. So today would be uh, 081023. And then I would put the names of the people I talked to, uh, whatever their names were. I forget. I made it up, right? What was these guys' names? It was Tom, Tom and whatever the wife's name was. But and we'll go from there. Uh, Brooke, do you have a question? Yeah. Um, I was wondering when you ask them who will be the notaries and they come up with a couple people, where do you write down that information for the referral if you're in the will? I want you I want you just to write the name down on the side on a piece of paper or put it into Excel or just notate the name and save it for a minute. Okay, that's all I want you to do. I'll show you where we're going to enter all that information in. So now that I'm, oh, I'm sorry, do I have another question? Amanda. Amanda. I don't know if this is the same question, but so where the witnesses were that we write those down, um, if if they'd rather have a notary, we can, they can, we just write that down separately. Is that the same as what? No, we're no, no. Okay. So understand what happens with the will. You need two witnesses regardless. And the only way that will is valid is if it's notarized. So no. I don't need the notary. What I want are the two witnesses. If they know who they might be, then I want to write their names down. More often oh. than not, they'll say, I have no idea. And that's fine. Okay. So it's a requirement to have both regardless. So you're just yeah, in them. any state, you're required to have a witness to your will. And you have to notarize it. The notarization is that somebody has verified your ID, mm -hmm. that you're legitimately who you say you are. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm a notary, but I didn't realize that there had to be a, two witnesses. I thought it was one. So I'm sorry. It could be one depending on what state you're in, but typically we ask for two because a lot of states require two. Okay. So that's what we say too. Okay. All right, so now that that's done, I'm going to go ahead and download it, and then I'm going to close it. And the next one I'm going to go to is the three important facts. So I'm going to click on that. And now the it's only two pages. First page is all the information. So on the script, I'm going to go through here. I'm going to say, OK, the next thing they have us do is talk about the important facts. Oh, I'm sorry, jumping around here. To, uh, right there, number one, number two, number three. And then we tell you exactly how much money you're going to get, all that stuff. And then we say, hey, do you have any questions about these burial benefits? So once you've explained that, they'll say no. And then you're going to turn the page. This is not the same as the veterans that we listed before, because those are people who will help the family interact with the VA. These are people that we want to actually have in the program, according to the VSOs. So that being the case, we then go through this. Hey, as we wrap up these benefits based on your service to the country, the veteran service groups have found that only one in every 200 veterans are aware of the program. So now we're stating a problem, right? And the problem is less than 1% of veterans are even aware of the program. And the VSOs are trying to educate all of them. And then we say, especially with 1,700 veterans passing away every single day, that's over 50,000 families looking for these benefits every month. And unfortunately, they're doing it usually after something has happened. So now we need to state the solution. We stated the problem is we don't have enough education out there for veterans. Let's state the solutions. They found that most veterans sponsor nine other veterans, you know, and then what you can do is you look right here, there's seven because the first two maybe had come from the previous one and now we're gonna list anybody else. So you can say this however you want, but you wanna see if they'll give you any other veterans. And then you're going to list them in that spot and you keep going to say, uh, keep going to say, you're going to continue to say who is next, who is next, who is next until they've exhausted their list. And then you're going to download the three important facts so that you can email it to the client once you finish the presentation. So let's go in here. I'm going to click on this and just give one fake name. Again, it's going to be Samuel Sweet, and I am a service member friend known. I was in the U.S. Army. Army National Guard, Army, there we go. And the ubiquitous 555s. San Jose. All right, so now I have at least one, and I'm going to go in and click the floppy disk. The data has been saved successfully. Again, I'm going to go in the upper right hand corner. I'm going to click on the down arrow with the line underneath it to download it. If I wanted, I could play this message for veterans. 
My name is Kimmy Shano, 20 year Navy veteran, 30 year VFW member. I've held positions in the VFW from post all the way to the national headquarters in Kansas City, Missouri. VSOs like the VFW are fighting on Capitol Hill to protect the benefits that you as a veteran are entitled to. We are looking forward to you becoming a member of the VFW and part of our family. Hello, my name is Kim Channel, 20 years. So he's playing it again. You don't have to necessarily play that, but you can if you want, if you felt it would be important. And usually I do that if people are like, hey, I don't, I don't know anybody, I'm not interested in doing that. I would then play that little video. Well, here's a message from somebody in the program. But if they're giving me names, I'm not going to slow myself down. I just want to take those names. Then I'm going to click that. The little balls are going to rotate. Hopefully something will show up. Let's see three important facts. Click on it. Oh my gosh, there it is. And there is Samuel Sweet. Hey, it actually worked. And then I'm going to save that into a directory so I can email it later. Now I'm completely done. I'm going to close that. Whew. Okay, so now I've done all of that. Now I'm going to go into the sponsorship program. I need to click on the sponsorship program icon. So this is a little misleading. If I, when I do that, I'm going down here to this thing right here, the third from the left or the fourth from the right, however you want to look at it. That's the sponsorship program. That's the one I want you to click on. Do not click on this sponsorship program because if you click on this, all it's going to do is show you what they get. You don't need to do that because I'm going to show you how they're going to see this anyway. Okay, so don't click on the, that one. Click on this one. That's the key. So I'm going to go in and click on that one. And now this shows up with this screen. Okay. So let's look at the text. It says, everyone you mentioned will automatically receive access to the veteran benefits we just covered. So as you're saying that, they're looking at this screen, hopefully on their phone or whatever. What I want you to do is click the word activate. Every time you click the word activate, this number increases to 2000 and this no longer is grayed out. So remember what I said, everyone you mentioned will automatically receive the benefits we just covered. So now you can see, I just jumped that up to 10,000. Again, this is another psychological thing because everyone receives a $2,000 accidental death and sperm certificate. So when you click activate for each one of these, the client is seeing the number of total gifted climb by 2000. People like to give away money that isn't theirs. <laughs> they may not want to give away their money, but they love it when somebody wins the lottery or they win something because in their mind, it's not their money. So if they can give something away and that number increases, they feel good about it. So now that you've done that, you're at this point in the script, you've now done this. And now you say, aside from the veterans you provided, the VSOs have authorized you to extend your benefits to those closest to you even if they didn't serve. Now they recommend they need to be at least 21 years old and if they're either employed or retired in good standing with the law. So understand what we're asking for. And then we say, lastly, because we don't solicit veterans and their families, the VSOs require your permission for me to contact them and let them know that you're doing that. Now, when you're saying that, you're not asking them to give you permission. You've already activated them. Everyone following with me? What I don't want you to do is make the client think that they have to say yes to all of these because that defeats the purpose. They've already said yes because they've given you the information either in the survey, the family information guide, three important facts of the will kit. So it's all there. Okay. So then the next thing is, okay, is there anyone you mentioned you wish to disinherit? That's the key. You're going to give them a chance to say no, but the way you're going to do it is use the word disinherit. Why are we doing that? Because most people do not want to disinherit anybody. It's again, it's a psychological move. Yes, uh, Wayne, what can I do for you? I'm sorry. Could you just go over that part again? Um... St starting at the in, on the other form where we were listing the veterans that might be activated, if you because you because I'm I'm trying to connect the dots and I, and I'm missing something. Yeah, well, could, could you, I can't go back. You mean this screen right here? Yeah. Okay, so when this screen first comes up, none of these people are activated. Okay, that right. means that the total gifted says zero. So as you once you bring this screen up. In the script, you are saying these words right here. 
everyone you mentioned will automatically receive access to the veteran legacy benefits we just covered, and they will also have access to the permanent benefits that we'll discuss in just a minute. As you're saying that paragraph, I want you to click on activate for each one of these people because the client is watching your screen and they're seeing that the total gifted number goes up. The reason that we have you do that is because people like to give away money that isn't theirs. Does that make sense, Wayne? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so now that you've got that up, what we're saying is that we're going to give a $2,000 accidental death and dismemberment certificate to each one of these people that you listed. And then we let them know that aside from the veterans you provided, they've ought, the VSOs have authorized you to extend your benefits to those closest to you, even if they didn't serve. So now we're saying you are able to give away access to this benefits to anybody you so choose, even if they aren't a service member. Now, what we recommend is that they're at least 21 years old. They're either employed or retired in good standing with the law. Why is that? Because people who are under the age of 21 do not buy insurance. Very rarely. I mean, less than one, less than tenth of a percent. So why waste our time? If they're employed or retired, that means they have money to buy the permanent benefits. And if they're not in good standing with the law, then they're not going to be covered by us. Right. If they have a felony arrest, we can't provide coverage to them. So that's why we say this. Then we say, lastly, we don't solicit them. So we require your permission. And the way we're going to ask you if you have your permission, is there anyone you mentioned you wish to disinherit? So when you say it that way, people will like, well, I don't want to disinherit anybody. Now they're not thinking of, well, I don't want you to reach out and contact somebody. What they're thinking is, well, who wouldn't I give this to? You see how the, the thought process shifts? Because if you don't say, do you, who do you wish to disinherit? Then in their mind, they're thinking, well, I don't want you to bother these people. So that sometimes they'll say, I don't want you to contact anybody or don't contact uh, Sean Jones or whatever, right? They could do that. But if you flip the coin and say, well, which one of these people do you wish to disinherit from receiving these benefits? They look at it differently and they'll typically let you contact everybody. Does that make sense, Wayne? Wayne, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, um, I I understand more now. I understand okay. more now. Thank Perfect. you. Yep, Brooke, pick it. What can I do for you? So even if they didn't serve, if they didn't serve the accidental death benefit, does it is it only for a year? Yes, the accidental death benefit lasts for one year, but you can renew it. You can call us back up and get it again. So it can go in, per, in perpetuity. Okay. So understand what's happening here. An insurance company like us will cover anybody who qualifies, but our marketing approach is for unions, uh, trade associations, credit unions, VSOs, not because we want to exclude anybody, but because when we focus on a particular market, we sell a certain way. But just like any of you, if you have friends, you could sell to them. They don't have to be a part of anything. As long as they qualify, you could sell to them as long as you're licensed in the state of which they're physically in. Does that make sense? Brooke? Yeah. So if if I did sell this to a friend, um, would they get the accidental death benefit or the yeah, the two thousand dollar accidental death benefit for yeah. a year? Yeah, you could give that to them now. As a matter of fact, all of you should get it. You're all yeah. eligible. Anybody can get it. So think of it this way a two thousand dollar accidental. How many people are in this class? Hold on, let me walk you through this logic here. There's 27 of you in this class. So if, and you can all get to the $2,000 accidental death and dismemberment certificate, right? So that would be $2,000 times 27 is equal to $54,000. So if you all died doing an accident tomorrow, the company would have to pay out $54,000, right? Let's hope that doesn't happen, but let's say it potentially could. But here's the reality. Most people don't even realize that the number of people who die due to an accident is less than 1%. And as you get older, the percentage of dying by an accident goes even lower because you're now drinking uh, liquids, eating food, <clears throat> breathing air that has contaminants, you're exposed to viruses and diseases and your own DNA begins to break down. So the older you get, the more likely you're gonna die from natural causes. So 
we take the 54,000 at best, and we're going to multiply that times 0 0.01. That means the company looks at the risk of $540 for 27 of you to have $2,000 accidental death and dismemberment coverage, right? You know what $540 is to American Income Life? <laughs> so, but, I want, but seriously, it's a marketing expense. One of a percentage of interest. Right. It's, it's, a, it's a marketing expense. American Income Life looks at that $2,000 and says to itself, well, every single time I give it out, the likelihood that I'll ever pay it out is less than 1%. So every single time, it's 20 bucks. Do you think American Income Life will spend $20 for every lead? Absolutely. So that's exactly what's happening. Okay, it's a lead. And they're willing to spend $20. So from our perspective, the client's thinking we're giving away 10,000 based on the information I have here. But in reality, the company knows they're never going to pay out $10,000 based on the actuary tables. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? Let me ask one person. Ben, does that make sense to you? Yes, sir. All right. So now that we've gone through that, whew, where are we at in the script? So now we're going through this and then they say, oh, I don't want to disinherit anybody. Cool. And then we say, other than the people listed in your family information guide, who do you want to extend these to next? Because now we're saying they are not people that be, need to be contacted and they're not veterans. Is there anybody else that you want to extend the benefits to? Well, what do you mean, Sam? I mean, anybody. You have friends in your reading group, in your knitting group, a pool, uh, you know, at your cabana club in your neighborhood that you take your kids to. I mean, anybody. You can extend these benefits to anyone you want. So once I make that clear to a client, sometimes they'll give me more names like, oh, you know who would like this would be so, so, so and so. The record for a number of referrals is 128 in one sit. 128. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't care if I ever sell to that person. But if you're going to give me 128 people I can reach out to using this system, showing the value of what we're going to give them, I'll take it every single day. But I don't get 128. I usually get about eight to ten. So we've gone through there. We've done all this. Now, here's what we need to do. We're going to ask the client <clears throat> of the people that are listed, who are the two or most important that we need to get the benefits out to first. So if you notice, if I scroll up or down, I have this little heart emoji next to each one of these. If I click on that, that now means that that is a priority. So when this lead drops into my lead pack, I'll have a little gold star next to that person's name. And then I can sort on my leads by those gold stars. And I know those are the people I want to contact first, right? So that's how that works. Then it says, hey, once finished up with the, or actually, sorry, favor referrals and send referral text during presentation. So here's how you do that. You come here and you're going to say, okay, it's Mary Jones, right? I'm going to click on this. It's going to send a group notification. When it comes up, it's going to give me my name as the agent, the client is Tom Jones, and whoever that referral is, that phone number. Okay. When I do that, or actually, let me change this phone number. Uh, ben, if you don't, who has their cell number? Ben, do you have your cell available? Do you have your cell phone available? What's your phone number? 910. 910. 297. 297. 6309. 6309. Okay, so when I do this, what's going to happen is it's going to send a text ostensibly to me, but hopefully it sent it to Ben. Ben, let us know when you receive it. Got when, it. Okay, you got it. Can you read to us what it says? Uh, I don't like that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, you're okay. Hi, Mary. This is Samuel Sweet uh, with a is that AIL. Yep. Yeah. I handle benefits for veterans and their families for your brother, Tom Jones. Tom was okay, able you to can stop. You can stop. You can stop, Ben. So sure. that message got sent to Ben acting as me as the agent. So you're like, well, why would you send it to yourself? Well, here's the thing. That message goes out for me in my cell phone. So now it's on my cell phone. Let's say Ben's the agent. It goes to him. He's going to take that message and he's going to forward it to the two people, right? To both the client who's sponsoring uh, the lady and then the lady herself. And it's coming from his cell phone, okay? So you just forward it, it's good to go, everything's done. 
And then you tell the client, hey, just uh, respond with a thank you. So that way she knows or whoever the person is being sponsored that this is legitimate. Okay. Right. And so the client says, okay, oh, I just got it, Sam, from you. Great. Just say thank you or great job or whatever you want to say. So they say great job because it's me. They say great job and they send the text out. So now the client has a text that was sent from him back, or sent, I'm sorry, he gets a start over. I sent a text to the client and the sponsoree. The client responds with great job. And now the sponsoree has a text from the client saying great job, right? So now that builds the credibility. I don't need to do anything in terms of uh, building credibility yet, because the next thing I'm going to do, am I sharing my screen? Yes. All right. I'm going to come right here and I'm going to click on sponsor receipt. When I click on that, now I'm going to send a text from the system. 910 whatever show that to Mary Jones and it will include this graphic telling her I mean it's tough to read but it says you've been sponsored to receive the following benefits for veteran veteran families at no cost and when I send that it then gives me a check mark it tells me the message is queued successfully and now I have these two things right here so what I've just done is I've leveraged the power of credibility from the client, not for me, that responded to the text. She sees this and then I follow up with the receipt and oh my gosh, now I've got a nice picture sitting there. Isn't that cool? Yeah. The system is really great and it helps you build credibility with your referrals immediately. And then you can just send a text to her and say, hey, I just want to follow up with you and let you know I'm going to give you a call later today or give you a call tomorrow. What time could be good for you? Whatever it is you want to say. Okay. Woo. All right. So we finish all that. And then the script says, hey, once finished with the sponsor program, click, 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 click the floppy disk icon in the right hand corner and ensure all the referrals are saved. So once you're done with all of this, what it will do is it will say, okay, click the floppy disk. And then it should save all of it to your uh, lead inbox. And why is it not doing that? Oh, right here. It, when, it, when it doesn't do anything, it's telling you it's missing a piece of information. Right here, it's missing this. So it's a lead type. So when you add somebody new in, you have to tell it, what type of lead? So if I hold over this, it says sponsored veteran lead or sponsored veteran referral. That means this lead type is an actual veteran. Whereas if I go on here, it says veteran family referral, that's family, friends, or emergency contacts. The reason that's important is we report back to the VSOs how many actual veterans we meet with. So obviously the numbers will include the veteran lead itself, but if that person gives us any referrals or veterans, the VSOs want to know that because they want to track how many veterans are actually being communicated with all this information. Virginia Robertson, what can I do for you? All right, so I'm sorry, I, I tried as soon as I can to get your attention, but on the pattern where you send the first message that goes out to the our client and their referral, okay, yeah, then you said, then you wait for the, and then the next step is the client, our client will then text great thank you or whatever. Yes. And then you were saying you click the next bu button, which then sends another text that is really just between the, the agent and the client, correct? Yeah, the target. Target. Okay, but my question is, A, you have to wait for um, the the veteran to um, say great or something. Yeah, you have to wait. Yes. Pardon? Yes, you have to wait because you need the credibility of the client to the sponsoree or the referral. You have to wait for him to say, or them to say great or thank you or something because that's the credibility moment. Because if you don't have any information, all of a sudden you get a text from Sam Sweet, you're like, I don't know who this is, I don't care. But if you get the text from Ben, you're like, I know Ben, and Ben just did something. Okay, cool. And then you see another text that comes in with the sponsored benefits, you're more likely to respond to my phone call when I call you. Well, 
So you're on the phone with him. I'm on uh, Zoom with him, him. Waiting for him to do it. You say, can you please now do this, right? Yeah, it takes him a second. He just responds and says, thank you. Literally, it doesn't take very long for him to do that. And you only do that for two of them. Well, I, I, if I can do it for every single referral he gave me, I'm going to do it. But I definitely want to do it for the ones that he said who I should contact first. Okay. Okay. All right. Amanda. So you do it for the ones that he, you're going to contact first. And then, and so you just ask them and say, hey, I'm sending out um, to, to your important people this thing. Could you just say thank you? Uh, so I know that you're on the Thing. I mean, don't I'm not seeing exactly. Amanda, Amanda, I do okay. not ask. How do you say it? it's? I'm not seeing the exact words in the script. Because it's up to you how you want to say it. I'm not going to make it prescriptive when it comes to that because it's it's an art thing as opposed to a mechanical thing. I'm going to say, hey, Amanda, I'm going to send you a text and I'm going to send a text to Mary. All I need you to do is respond with thank you. That way, Mary knows that I'm not some marketing guy. And everybody that I've ever said that to says, oh, okay, no problem. They have their phone right in front of them and they do it. Okay. Well, that's great because I, I just didn't know how to say that because I've never said it before. So I wanted it right. Man, really? You have a personality. It'll be fine. However you say it, people are like, oh, okay, no problem. We're going to do it for you. Okay. I'm confident you're going to do well. So now that I've done all that, now I have everything listed, everything supposedly is done. I'm going to click on this little floppy disk. And when I do that, I still have the problem of I didn't add the family members. So I'm going to do that. Now I'm going to click the floppy disk and oh my gosh, it says to access sponsorships, go to your planet or mobile. We'll come to that tomorrow. So remember the names I put in there, Tom Jones, all that other stuff. All right. So now I've done the sponsoring stuff. So in the script, I am here. I've gone through all of that and now I'm on page eight. I need to transition to the read off letter. So I'm going to say, hey, the next benefit your child receives is the needs analysis survey. Recommendations by the VSOs are based on your responses, provided you qualify for the program. Now, obviously, the VA's $893 burial allowance is not enough to take care of your funeral, let alone the final expenses such as taxes, attorney fees, any medical housing or credit card debt left behind. So what they ask us to do is read this letter to each veteran to back up and fill you in everything that's going on. So what you're going to do is show page two of the letter. If it's a response card, whatever letter that was used, if it's PAVIT, you're going to use SGMAD. So the way you do that is you come over here. There's the letter. We're going to click on it. And when we click on it, it shows the first page. You need to move to the next page. Now, depending on what market you're in, there may only be one page of a letter. That's fine. Just show that page. Now, you don't need to zoom in here because this is what we're talking about. So legally, we actually have to read off something because it's transitioning from the no cost free stuff into the permanent benefits or that which costs money. So the way we do that is we actually read this document in the veteran market. If you read this, regardless of what organization that that letter came through, this will cover you. So you don't have to read the letter itself. Just read this every time. So dear veterans insurance programs being offered to you today are made possible through the voluntary cooperation of veteran organizations and American income life. These coverages are supplemental and that they are not in competition. And then you just read that paragraph and then you're done. Once you read that paragraph, now you can explain what that means. So obviously this was written by attorneys and it's cover us legally and it makes sure we're in compliance with the VSOs. But we always want to explain when stuff is long and sounds complicated. So we didn't say, hey, I want all that saying is after I show you all the benefits, explain how they work and answer any questions that you have. If you qualify, you and your family would be able to take advantage of these benefits during your service period, which is today while we meet on Zoom. It's important that you say that because you're trying to set the expectation with the client that, hey, we're about to go and talk about these benefits. And if you qualify, then I can enroll you now. You need them to start thinking this is something they're doing right now. Okay, so once you've done all that, and when I'm finished, I'll be fill out a report, goes back to the VSOs, let them know I explained the benefits and I did my job, does that sound fair? Everyone goes, yeah, that sounds fair, okay, cool. So now you've done that, now you can close this because I don't need to send this letter to them. 
And now, according to the script, I'm on B3 qualification. I come down here to the third, I'm sorry, the second icon from the left. I click on the needs analysis and lo and behold, you all know this screen, right? We've already gone through this screen. The difference is, is that everything is filled in this time because I got all the information from the survey and it flowed all the way through. So the first thing I have to do is ask these questions. Okay, so according to the script, what does it say here? Under 60, ask the super combo, or over 60, ask senior questions. So I am here. These people, their birth dates are 1990 and 1991 respectively, they're under 60. So I'm going to ask the super combo questions. The super combo is for people under the age of 60. Senior is defined in the insurance world as anybody 60 or older. So I'm going to ask them, hey, Tom and Helen, do either one of you take prescription medications? If the answer is yes, then I want you to click on notes and list the prescription, what they're taking it for and how much they're taking for your own notes. Okay. If the answer is no, then you select no and you answer every question. Have you had any health issues in your lifetime? And you're talking about long chronic health issues or something significant or serious not broke my ankle, not have back pain, sore back from pulling weeds in the yard, you know, but if you're jumping out of helicopters and you've damaged your back, your knees, your joints, then yeah, that could be something you put in there, right? That's, and you want to know about it now as opposed to later. So in this case, we're just going to say no. Do you use tobacco or marijuana in any form? We have to know the answer to this. Two reasons. Number one, if you use tobacco, you're considered a tobacco user and your rates will go up. If you use marijuana in any form, you must be considered a tobacco user and mark that appropriately. So if you use marijuana in any form, you are considered a tobacco user. And the reason for that is people who use marijuana, according to the actuary tables, they die much sooner than people who do not use marijuana. Okay. Again, we're not making any moral judgments on anything. They just, just die happier. <laughs> we're just going with the facts right and the facts tell us hey if you use marijuana you die sooner so in this case we're just going to say no and then the last one is have you had any arrest including dui because that's important if you've had an arrest for a felony then you do not qualify you will be considered an auto decline and we'll go through all of that on tuesday and wednesday of next week so in this case we're just going to keep it clean and say no to everything then we're going to ask them to confirm this information so they're going to look at it, they'll confirm it, then we'll say, do you have any insurance pay off death? Nope. Do you have any children? Nope. So I'll say no and no here. Are you retired? Well, they're fairly young, so, but I still ask the question. So they're not retired and their hourly income is already set. So Helen does pretty well. Right. Do you bank locally? Yes, I already answered that question, so it's filled in. And then I'm looking over here for the dollar a day approach, right? So I could pick our power philosophy, I could pick monthly, or I can pick dollar a day. We start with dollar a day. So the dollar a day is where the VSOs are recommending the middle at five, and then we give enhanced. Okay, so we already went through that. We know that. But there are other approaches. I could do monthly, and what the system will tell us is how much uh money that would be set aside for the monthly but we don't do that here i'll show you where we do that but not here we could do our power philosophy and what that's doing is it's setting aside one to two hours of their pay every week to pay for the permanent benefits so that only works that typically works with people who are working but most of the people in the veteran market are older they're usually retired so we go with the hour I'm sorry, the dollar a day approach. Okay, so we want to move that to $5. All right, we have this, we have her. Let's see, Helen is in here. Helen is a female and he is a male. So everything looks good. We're confirming it. And now I would pause my screen. And when the screen is paused, I'm coming over here to the plan generator. I'm going to click on the plan generator. The first thing I'm going to do is come up here and make sure that Helen is set at $5 a day. 
because that's where I need her to be. I'm going to change the A71, in fact, to the triple family because there's two of them. I'm going to allocate the remaining. And when I allocate, now I'm at 304.17 or roughly within a penny. I'm happy there. Next thing I'm going to do is go to plan options. I'm going to rename the first plan to recommended. And I'm going to rename the second plan to enhanced so that I'm giving them two different options. When I click on the checkbox, the blue one shows up. Right now I'm still in green. I'm going to come over here and click on the blue one. And when I do that, the first thing I'm going to do is change this up to $9 a day. So there's a significant difference in value proposition to the client between enhanced and recommended. Once I have nine put in place here, the very next thing I'm going to do is change triple family to the highest one that's available to me, which is quintuple family. If you're in Florida, you can actually go to six or sextuple. So I'm going to click on quintuple. Then I'm going to come over here. I'm going to allocate remaining. And I am going to see that now I'm at 547.50, 547.50. The next thing I'm going to do is click on recommended because we read from left to right. This is the one that I want to show first. Adam Bendel, what can I do for you? Can you explain the families a bit, like the options as to no. why you're doing triple, what that means? No. No. <laughs> no, I will. I'm going to do that after we take a break because I'm going to go through policy information and then it'll be very clear why I'm doing this. Okay. Sounds good. So, perfect question. Good timing. I just want to hold off for just a moment. All right, so we have all that done. This now looks fairly good. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to come down here to the second or third icon from the left on present plan. I'm going to click on it. When present plan comes up, this screen comes up. And now I am going to look at the script. I've done this. I've done that. I've done that. Now I'm going to talk about the dollar a day concept. I'm actually going to say now they set up the benefits for all the veterans using dollar a day and explain what that means. Once I've explained what that means, and by the way, when I do this, as I'm saying these words, I'm building the plan. So I really don't take very long. You can get to that point when you practice and do enough presentations. If you have to take more time, that's okay. Just let the client know, hey, give me a minute. I'm waiting for the system to give the recommendations based on your responses. So that way they're not thinking they're waiting on you. They're just waiting on your computer to do its thing. Okay. Then you're going to click on present plan. You're going to click on resume share button on the zoom toolbar. And then here you go. We start this part of the show. It says, Hey, let me ask you, have you, have you had a plan of participating planning a funeral? Why do we do that? We have to state the problem. And then we come up with the solution. Absham, what can I do for you? Uh, so, you know, when you do allocate the uh, plan and then you hit finish. Yeah. So all those zeros say that, but if I go to the second plan, then all those zeros go back to like negative 0.12 or whatever. Like all of them just change by itself. So do I have to, if I'm, when I do this with the clients, would I have to like keep doing allocate finish or? Is it going to stay like that? So in here, I did it and it's staying like that. So I don't know what you mean. It, you so, saw the number changes right here? No, the the remaining changes. If you click on enhance. Right here? Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So I do allocate and all these numbers stay zeros. But if I like get out of, I hit finish. And then I get out of it and I go into enhance. Like I go into the second plan. I not. I come back to this one, then all those zeros change. I don't know why. Yeah, what it didn't happen change? with you. Well, what, when you say they change, what does the MBD change to? Like a penny? Yeah, yeah. It does. That's okay. The system is trying oh, to calculate okay. based on the average number of days in a month. So don't worry if you're oh, off by okay. a penny. That's perfectly fine. Okay. Melissa, 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 what happened? You went away. Well, and the reason I went away is because that was happening quite a few times yesterday with us. Like okay. we would we would do that and then all of a sudden it would change and we figured out it was we were doing things in an incorrect order. And so when we would change maybe our dollar amounts before our our triple family or our quintuple mm -hmm. family, if we did that in the wrong order, then it would reset our remaining amounts. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what we had figured out yesterday. If that helps. Okay. Perfect. So now we're here. Now I'm going to click on display plan or present plan. I always use the word display. I don't know why. Now what I do is I use the down arrows. 
So the first one I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the freedom of choice, right? Boom. So in the script um, here, I'm going through this, and then it says click on freedom of choice, which I just did. All your family has to do is take it to the funeral home, and now I'm going to show the allocated amount. So I'm going to click anywhere on the screen other than the freedom of choice. By the way, scroll down so your name shows on there. Very powerful to have your name on this form. So I'm going to click anywhere else, and when I do that, now what I do is hit the down arrow, and it will start with the any cause of death. So in the script, it says what they've allocated for you is, and that's for any cause of death. And what we say is he allocated $116,000 for you, Tom, and $172,000 for you, Helen. And then I keep reading the script and hitting the down arrow. Now, the reason I hit the down arrow is because sometimes people will ask me a question in this section. Well, any cause of death, what do you mean? What I want to do is go back. So I hit the up arrow because I only want them to focus on one thing at a time. That's just my style, but you can hit the space bar and just go through and leave it up. It's up to you. It's an art thing as opposed to a mechanical thing. So you get through all the rest of it. We do this. We do this. Now we're on a common carrier. We're good to go. Right. And now we're going to talk about what? What's the next thing we talk about? Anybody? Um, Everyone has the script in front of them. We're talking about accidental protection, right? So now I'm up here. Now yeah. I'm up here, hospital benefits, right? Uh -huh. So when I click on that, we talk about the emergency room benefit, the daily hospital benefit, and the intensive care benefit. Everyone tracking with me so far? So in the script now, I'm on the bottom of page 12, and the last thing I'm saying is that makes sense. So on page 13 now, I have protections and writers. Everything you guys see on the screen was created to protect you since these benefits are for veterans, they're permanent, that means this, 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 and this. What you do is you come over here and the little shield, you click on that. And then you, then you show them that and you walk through everything. Now you could click on this. I don't advise you do that because the idea was is we would show them the example of cash value. But what happens is clients think that that's exactly what they're gonna get. And they start asking you questions about everything they're seeing on this screen. I'm a big believer that do not create your own objections. So don't even bother to show this. Just leave it here and just talk through the script right here. All right, paid up benefits, ask them if it makes sense. And they'll say, yeah, okay, I got it. And then you go to D1. Now we're getting into the close, right? Now, is this the first time someone has done that? We have to ask that again because we need to make sure, we need to ascertain whether or not anybody's talked about numbers with them in the past. Because if they have, then we have to get more information out of them. Invariably, though, they usually say, nope, no one's ever met with me before. Great. Now we have to put a disclaimer in. So even though your enrollment started a while ago and you filled out your card, they can't go back and cover you for younger rates. So we want them to think, well, you, your enrollment already started when you sent in your response card or your request. It already started, but the rates on these have to be based starting today. So again, this is a psychological th thing, making them think that uh, they're enrolled, right? The more you get them to say yes, the more likely they'll say yes at the end. So now when you're qualified and enrolled, it'll come out once a month from your account of your choice. We need to let them know that it's a monthly bill, okay? And then we say, hey, let's face it, we're all gonna pass away. That's something that we don't have any choice or control over. So typically it comes down to veterans like yourself taking care of something like this now, or that burden will likely be placed on your family in the future. I like to talk about here liability versus legacy. You want to leave a legacy behind for your family or do you want to leave them a liability? Okay, so that gets us down to 13. Now we're going to ask the beneficiary question. So over here on this script, I'm in here. I'm going to go down here. Not the plan generator, but the second icon from the left, the beneficiary, that's going to pop up there. And I'm going to say now there's some other medical questions to see if you qualify, but probably the most important question they have me ask you is if something happens to both of you, like a bad car accident, there will be $410,000 that comes to the family for funeral and final expenses. Who do you want that money to go to? Again, everything I've talked about today, it's all about psychological, the way the script is set up. So I want you to think about this for a minute. If I told you that you're going to get all this stuff and you walk away and I ask you six months later, what is the number on this page, Amanda, you are going to remember? Well, will you remember um, to hit the mute? Yeah, I hope so. Um, 
So on the script or on the what they're seeing? On well, they are seeing this. This is what they're seeing. Mm -hmm. What is the number that you're going to remember six months from now? The number on here. The uh, uh, you're equivocating, Amanda. Repeating what I just asked you doesn't solve the answer or doesn't provide the answer. What is the number that you? That. What is the number on this page that you would remember six months from now? Uh, probably 90,000 because it's it's in red. It's in I, red, Amanda. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see that. Uh, the 400, 410,000. So it's the largest number on the page, and it's the one that everybody remembers. And how do I know that? Because I used to sell in the POS market, and I would ask people, Well, how much coverage do you think you have? And they would tell me invariably, Oh, I have about four hundred thousand dollars. Okay. So understanding the psychology that that's what people remember, we want them to tell us, well, who do you want that $410,000 to go to? And again, every single time you guys should put this name in here because I want to get paid. But here's the key. This $410,000 is the sum of any cause of death for both Tom and Helen. And it is the sum of the number one way that people die in accidents in North America, which is through a car accident. So 60 plus 60 plus 173 and 116 gets you $410,000. And that's the number that everybody remembers. That's an important distinction and why we put it there, okay? And then we say, hey, it doesn't matter to the veteran service organization which program you or any veteran try to qualify for. My job is to customize the benefits to fit your needs, right? So again, we're not selling, we're just saying, here, you know, this is the recommendation. It doesn't matter to us or the VSOs which one you pick. We just need to customize the benefits to fit your needs. And then we're going to press the benefit summary button. So according to the script, we're right here. We're about to press this benefit summary button. So when I do that, that's the button right there, a second from the right. I click on it, and lo and behold, now all the information is here. I've got how much I have to pay daily. I have the monthly bill where something happens. Sam is going to get paid. I show the benefits all the way through for the first one, which is recommended, which again is why we do things in a certain order. We read from left to right. So now what I say is they just need to know, do you want to do like most veterans do and go with what they're recommending? That's the plan that I have up here, setting aside $10 a day for both of you, which is about $304.17 a month, or do you want to qualify for the enhanced program that covers inflation? You actually receive a lot more coverage while only contributing a bit more. Now that number went from $410,000 to $777,000. We do that because we don't expect everybody to pick enhance because one, they may not see the value of that much, but we want them to know it's available because there will be a certain percentage of people who will want the enhanced. Absolutely. If you don't offer it, they won't buy it. So you've got to put it in front of them. Okay. So there you go. That is the closing question. They just need to know that you want to, do you want to do like most veterans and Go with what they're recommending, or do you want to try to qualify for the enhanced program? That is the closing question. That is when you're asking them which one they wish to purchase. Barbara, what can I do for you? Okay, so now that freedom of choice thing says any cause of death is 262. And then it says, um, then you have the choices of uh, the auto accident, the accident, the common carrier. So if I died in an auto accident. Does it cover the auto accident and any cause of death since the auto accident was some cause of death, you know, crushed my ribs and suffocated me or whatever? Well, I want you to think about it the other way around. Any cause of death will pay out no matter how or when you die as long as the policy is in force. So, you, right. so your beneficiary will always get that paid out. And on top of that, if you die in any type of accident, the minimal amount would be paid out is 50. If it's an auto accident, you get 100. And if it's common Gary, you get 250. So if I die in an auto accident, $415,669 will be paid out to Helen's beneficiary. Okay. 
Okay. I just wanted to make sure that it was, you know, that you collect from each thing that you're offering so that, you know, you it, if you die in an auto accident, you get the other things. Yes, you do. Okay, thank you. Yep, absolutely. So now we're here. We've asked the closing question, and now I'm going to give you a little bit of art. The art is this. Let's uh, role play. Amanda, since you're so bright and cheerly. Amanda, do you want to go with the recommended amount, which is about $3 or $4 a month, or do you want to try to qualify for the enhanced amount, which is about five forty-seven, dollars but you get over $700,000 in coverage? Mm, I'm going to stick with the base, or with the, just what's recommended right now. Can I right, do it later? Can I switch it up later if I have more money? You can always add, and I will set a time on my calendar that I will call you back in six months and we'll add more if you're ready, okay? Awesome. So she's gonna buy recommended. You are done with eApp for right now. You're gonna, I'm sorry, with uh, HP Pro, you are gonna move into eApp and close this thing down, okay? You are done. But let's say, Amanda, that you really can't afford 304.17, okay? So let's role play that one. So I'm going to say, hey, uh, Amanda, do you want to go with the recommended amount, which is about $304 a month, or do you want to try to qualify for the enhanced amount, which is about $547? Well, both of these are kind of out of our budget at this time. Okay. Do you see value in, in, in the program the VSO is recommending? Oh, yeah. I want my family taken care of. Perfect. But okay. And I think the VSOs, <laughs> the VSOs do as well. And that's exactly why I'm here. So what makes sense for you and your family? Um, I feel like we could budget out maybe like $200, $250 a month extra. Okay. But that's All it. right, so understand what just happened, everybody. She gave me a budget. Now, everything I had done up to this point is artificial, <clears throat> right? I'm yeah. creating these artificial budgets. She just gave me an actual budget. So I'm going to say, hey, you know, let me see what I can do for you at 250. OK, if I can get you something at 250, then we can get you enrolled. OK. OK. And Amanda says what? OK, let me see that. <laughs> what that so looks. she's now just that agreed that if I can get her under her budget, she's going to buy. Right. So mm -hmm. what I'm going to do now is I'm going to freeze my screen and I'm going to say, let me see what I can do for you. Everyone following with me so far? So my screen is frozen. I'm going to go back into the plan generator. I'm going to go to plan options. I'm going to click on this one and I'm going to call it Amanda's plan. Let's see if, yep, Amanda's plan. It'll show up over here as plan option three. I don't care about the approach anymore because I have an actual budget. So what I'm going to do is change this to monthly. And then I'm going to go to custom monthly because she gave me a number. We know it's going to be 250. I'm going to go to 249. Okay, $249. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change this thing here to one higher than what the lowest amount was. So in this case, I'm going to go to double family. Okay, when I go to double family, now I'm going to allocate remaining. I'm going to allocate for both, which will bring everything down. And now I have a plan at $249 with the A71, 96,000 and 110 respectively. Then I'm going to come here to the benefit summary and it's ready to go, I am now gonna un, or what? I'm gonna reshare my screen or unpause my share, however you wanna look at it. And this is now gonna replace the one she was looking at. And I'm gonna say, Amanda, great news. I, not the system, not the VSOs, I, cause I wanna own it now, right? I am gonna be the hero. Amanda, I was able to get this done for you. So I got you under your budget and I got you $287,000, $634 in coverage. And Amanda's gonna say what? Thank you, I appreciate that. Boom, and now I'm gonna roll right into enrolling her and her family. Do people often ask for that or? Yeah, uh, all the time. Very That's rarely really does somebody. Like Amanda, I've been that customer. Amanda, 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 when you ask a question and I'm trying to answer it, you can't just keep going. Because then we neither one of us hear each other. So uh, to answer your question specifically, people ask for this all the time, all the time, because most people you talk to probably can't afford three hundred four dollars. And how how you know that, Amanda, is if you take three hundred and four dollars and you multiply that times twelve, your ALP would be three thousand six hundred and forty eight. 
Well, we know the average ALP is 1,500, so 1,500 times, uh, sorry, 1,500 divided by 12 is 125. So most people are getting plans at about 125 bucks. But I don't want to drop that low if I don't have to because I want to maximize my sale, right? Make them as much money as I can and give the family the highest benefits possible. So I always will show them the recommended, the enhanced, and then I will try to get them to tell me what is their actual budget. As long as they believe in the value of what is shown to them, they will give you a number. And the statistics tell us that if you get them to give you a budget number, 85% of the time they will buy from you. There are going to be some who are like, oh, I need to think about it anyway. But if they give you a number and you give them a plan within that number, 85% of the time they're going to buy. All right, now, Amanda, I'm so sorry. What was the rest that you were saying? Oh, I was going to say I've bartered a lot in a lot of countries. And I've done that, like where I set the number and then people meet me there. So I know it's not it's not as common in America, but it's there's a lot of people like that that just especially old people want to negotiate well remember most times though they're not negotiating if they give you a number if you can get them to give you the budget they usually will buy based on that budget as long as they see the value now if they told you hey you know what all i can all i can afford is 50 dollars a month right let's say they did that so if we go to the plan generator and we change this to 50 Okay, and then we allocate the remaining and then we finish and we show them this plan. What ends up happening is they're only getting $13,000 in coverage. That drops down to 106. What will happen is people will go, well, that's not even worth what well, that's not worth it. I'm not getting enough. Do you see what I'm saying? So there is a certain number you shouldn't fall below. You will decide from an art perspective what that number is, because if it's me, and that's all they can afford, I'm going to try to convince them that that has value. Well, you know what? That almost covers everything. At least if you die, you only need to come up with $2,000 to pay for the funeral as opposed to the full $15,000. So I'm going to do my best to try to close it, even if it's a low number. But just keep in mind, the lower that number gets, the less value the entire program has. Okay? And lo and behold, everybody, that is the entire presentation from beginning to end including sponsorship, family information guide, will kit, uh, the three important facts, the sponsorship tool, the plan generator, and displaying all the benefits and then getting to the closing question. And on that, we're gonna take a 15 minute break. So I'd like everybody to come back at 25 minutes to the top of the hour. Thank you, everybody. <music> Bum. All right, everybody, we are back. Who are we looking for? Mike, there's Kristalina, there's Faith, there's Ben, there's Melissa, Adam, Heidi, Christian, Barbara, Joshua, Andrew, Rebecca, Brooke, Keaton, Jam Jamila, Jamila, oh my gosh, Jamila, uh, Rebecca, LaFontant, Wayne, waiting for Amanda, Virginia, Absham, Will, Niall, Eric, and Corolla, no, he's at work, and Zakaya, there we go. All right, <clears throat> so now you guys are all experts on how to give a presentation, right? Yeah, everyone nod your head, yeah, absolutely, you ready to go? Okay, so if I gave you a client lead right now, which one of you thinks you can actually get through a presentation? Nobody's raising their hand, that's okay. Well, no, Ben is, Ben's like, I'll, I'll, I'll sacrifice. I'll give it a shot, man, I'll sell anybody <laughs> anything, I don't care. There you I go. Try. <laughs> There we go. Okay, so we've gone through all of that. Let's talk a little bit about our products that we sell. Okay, because to Ben's question, or no, it was Adam's question before, how the heck is family and triple? What, what is going on? So we're going to walk through that together. So what I want you to do is I'd like you to open up attachment one, the AO International New Agent Packet. And I would like you to go <clears throat> to page 31, I think, right? 31? Yeah, 31. Oh, 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 oh. All right, page 31. So I'm going to share my screen so you can follow along, write notes, do whatever you want. But let's have a discussion, <clears throat> excuse me, about the products that we 
actually provide to our clients. So here we are. <clears throat> we have the first product, the main product. Our flat. Oh, Barbara has a question. Barbara, what can I do no, for you? I I um, wasn't seeing it um, that packet, so I thought I was looking at the name wrong. You know, remembering the name wrong. So I was going to ask you to repeat the name, but it's there. I see it. Thank you, though. You're very welcome. I'm glad I can answer a question before you even ask. It's awesome. Virginia Robertson, what can we do for you? What the heck? What? Virginia, we need to put a big note on your computer that says you must unmute in order for anybody to hear you. <laughs> I'm not practiced in this. Okay, so. It's all right. Um, my uh, drive set only goes up to 21. Is that yeah. for me? The file is 01 AO International New Agent Packet. Oh, okay. Which says page 31? Yeah, page 31. Okay. I'm, I'm down. I got it. Perfect. There we go. All right. So on, am I doing it? Yeah. On the screen, <clears throat> I think you can see where it says AL products. We start with whole life. Whole life is the flagship product. It's where you're going to make all your money. <clears throat> Attach that whole life product. And then you have to remember, I believe all of you have passed your test or about to pass your test. So you have a lot of knowledge <clears throat> that went through your state mandated training. <clears throat> Pardon me. So hopefully the words I use, the acronyms I use should be familiar to you. So the whole life product has the freedom of choice, which is a certificate that the company uses, uh, or rather the family uses to pay for the funeral. The way that it works, that a family takes their certificate down to the funeral home and assigns the benefits of the funeral director. And if there's any money in the policy greater and the amount that has been assigned to the funeral director, then that money gets paid out to the beneficiary. Okay. We also say that that money's paid out within 24 to 48 hours. So Amanda, how in the world are we able to pay out the whole life product so quickly? Because you guys have it in reserve. No, every insurance company has money in reserves. Insurance companies by state law are allowed to take up to six months to make a payout. Mm -hmm. Oh, so Have I don't you know. Ever had to do a handle a funeral? Yes. Did you get the proceeds of a life insurance policy? No, it was very bad. Okay, has anybody handled a funeral where they had to deal with the insurance company? If you have, well, raise your hand. All right, so Virginia, you're saying no, but your hand is up, so I'm confused. Which one is it? No, yes, maybe so. Okay, there she goes. Barbara Wambacher and Wayne Butler. Okay, <clears throat> so both of you have handled funerals. So in your case, Barbara, how long did it take for the insurance company to pay out the money to you? Um, my my husband passed away, and he had quite a, a lot of insurance. But there was this one company and it was only for a small amount. So I kept forgetting to, it was like a $10,000 policy or something. But at any rate, every time I called them, they would say that I, I needed to send something in or they're working on it or they're doing this or they're doing that. And um, they reminded me, you have six months, you know, we have six months and I'm like, okay, well, I just wanna make sure you don't forget about it. But it did take them just about up to the six months which made me believe that they're investing that money and trying to get, you know, um, interest on it and use that interest to pay me. Well, no, that's not what they're doing. So we'll talk about what they're doing when they delay a payout like that. But the other companies that did pay you out, how long did it take them to send you the money? Probably three days. Um, and one was three days. The one from his work was like a week. And um, yeah, yeah, he had like three of them, maybe four, but it was all within a week or two that I got all the other ones. It was okay, just that Wayne, one. Okay, Wayne, how long did it take you to get paid out? Actually, it took 
took about three days. Um, I got no complaints from the uh, director, film director, when I when I had the call. Okay. So you, you, both of you, I'm glad that they paid out soon. That's not typically the experience the average American has when they get paid out with insurance. It usually takes a while. I can't tell you exactly how long it takes. I don't look at the statistics, but again, state law allows them to take up to six months. When Wayne, when you got paid out, what did the insurance company require from you? That's the thing to do. Right, but that, that, they don't require that from you. They require a death certificate. They can get it directly from the uh, ME or whatever. But what did you have to do in order to get your check? Do you remember? Honestly, nothing. Um, I had to forward a death certificate um, as a claim. Did you ever sign a document, Wayne? No. You probably don't remember, but you did. You had to sign a document. In order to get the check, you had to sign something from the insurance company. Uh, Barbara, what's yes. that? I said it doesn't come to mind. Yeah, okay, Barbara, did you have to sign anything? Um, no, I don't think so. I don't remember that my husband passed away almost 20 years ago. Um, it's been a while, but I guarantee. But I can you. tell you that I uh, the last job that I had, it was working with the um, people enrolling into the work benefits and stuff like that. And a woman had called me, and she was trying to get her be her daughter's benefits to pay for the funeral thing. And it turned out she did not get those benefits because. She didn't have the policy long enough, you know, like you have to have a policy for a certain amount of time before mm -hmm. they'll pay out. And she was fighting with the insurance company for, and it turned out that the daughter just didn't have the policy long enough before she passed away. Okay. So let's assume that we've met the threshold, whatever happens to be. In order for insurance company, well, first of all, everyone needs to understand that insurance companies are in the business of what? Risk management. That's all they're in. That's the business we're in. That's why we use statistics. We use actuary tables because what we're trying to do is we're trying to evaluate risk and then assign a monetary value to that risk. So if I buy an insurance policy for myself today, if I were married, and I died three years from now, my wife is going to have to sign a document. And that document is an indemnification because the insurance company knows what their risk is for the policy that I originally bought. Let's say the policy was for $50,000. So the insurance company knows I have, or they know they have $50,000 of exposure that when I die, they need to pay it out. Now, what they're doing is they're assuming that they're going to get enough premiums to offset the loss. So it's a constant game of seeing how many people are paying premiums, how much are your losses, et cetera, et cetera. When insurance companies get in trouble, it's when the claims get too high as opposed to the premiums coming in. That's why you see a lot of property and casualty companies end up going out of business or going bankrupt with natural disasters because they have to pay out too much money all at once and they don't have enough premiums to offset the loss. Life insurance companies typically don't have that problem because people tend to live long enough to pay the premium so that way the insurance company is not at risk. But it's just like, how explain, it's like a bookie. I mean, not much, it's legit and everything, but a bookie is looking at odds and they're moving the odds depending on how somebody how the total population is bet so that they're never upside down. They never have to pay out more than they took in. So the insurance company is doing the same thing, but the insurance company is managing or mitigating the risk of ensuring that they don't have to pay out more than what the face value of a policy is. So I die three years from now, my fictitious wife is going to apply for the, or submit the death claim and the insurance company, the first thing they will do, no matter what insurance company it is, they're going to require that she signs the indemnification because they don't want her to come back after them for any more money than what was on the face value of the policy. 
So those of us that have done that, we, that's what you have to do. There's just no way an insurance company is going to give you a check without having you sign something saying you're not entitled to receive anything else. Because what ends up happening is if you take the money, you didn't sign anything, you go to a smart attorney, they're going to sue the insurance company for more money. And now the insurance company doesn't have anything that says they shouldn't pay you. Now it's going to go into the legalities of how the policy was set up and all that other stuff, right? Insurance companies don't want to do that. What they want to do is say, I'll pay your widow, Sam, the 50000 but I'm not paying her any more than that. Okay? So in order for her to get the money, she has to sign an indemnification. So that happens 100% of the time. Okay. So assuming that happens... How in the world can we claim that we're going to pay out within 24 to 48 hours to a funeral home? Well, the reason we're able to do it is because we're not actually paying the money out to the beneficiary. What, in fact, we're doing is we're taking the freedom of choice. We're on the back of that form. In my example, my widow is assigning $10,000 of the insurance policy to the funeral home to pay for my funeral. Let's just say that was the case. The insurance company is not engendering any additional risk by paying out that money to the funeral home because my widow has said and signed that the proceeds of this insurance policy, I want $10,000 to go to the funeral home. So she can't ever claim to get that $10,000 back from the insurance company. So there's no risk there. The insurance company sends a check or wires the money to any funeral home in North America, they're not worried about any additional claim by the funeral home because it's a business transaction for services rendered. So the funeral home can never ask for more money, right? So the reason we can move so quickly with the freedom of choice is because there's no risk to us. We've mitigated that risk completely. And in return, we go around and we say, okay, we can get this paid out in 24 to 48 hours. The reason we do all of this is back in the day as a union, the only union insurance company, we would have union leaders come to us and say, you know, we have a problem. So, okay, well, what's the problem? The problem is we have insurance on our union members. Let's say it's a, a longshoreman. He's working the docks on these ships and he has a crane collapse and kill him by falling on he has insurance, but the insurance company is doing the same thing that Barbara talked about. They're waiting the full six months. They're like, oh, we're going to get to it. It's in process. And they know they have six months legally before they have to pay you out. But here's what happens is that you need to still have the funeral and bury your loved one. So imagine you're a guy who gets paid a lot of money. You're a head of a union. And you're watching the widow of one of your union members have to do bake sales, car washes, go fund me pages, all this stuff to try to come up with enough money to do what? Bury the loved one. We're not even talking money to take care of the house, the bills, none of that. We're just saying to bury this person, the widow is not necessarily debasing herself. I don't want to get that extreme, but she's having to go out on the charity of strangers to bury a loved one. So if you're the union boss and you're seeing this, it is not a good look, right? Because the union boss is supposed to be taking care of all his union uh, members and it's not happening. They have insurance, but it's not getting paid out yet. So the union leaders came to us and said, look, we need to make sure that at least the funeral and fall expenses are taken care of. So we sat down and said, okay, we'll do this. What, instead of re requiring an indemnification from the widow, in my example, will let the widow assign a certain amount of the face value of the policy to the funeral home. And then we will contact the funeral home and handle all the transaction of money. So the money never goes to the widow of the 10,000 in my example, it goes directly to the funeral home. So that limits our exposure as an insurance company that the widow can't come after us for any more than 10,000 to bury it. And because it's a business transaction with the funeral home, the funeral home can't come after us for any additional money. I've managed my risk and I've taken care of ensuring that any loved ones, their funeral and final expenses will at least be taken care of. I'm not going to have a public display of somebody not being able to be buried because there's not enough money to do it. Wayne Butler, what can I do for you? That's all by assignment. I'm sorry? That is all by assignment. Benefits have been assigned to the funeral, to the funeral home. 
I, and I can barely, I mean, I'm not sure I understand. Yeah, the benefits are assigned to the funeral home, but it's a, it's only a dollar amount. So let's say the policy is 25. She assigns 10. So the, only the $10,000 goes to the funeral home, but the other 15 will be paid out to the widow once she signs the identification waiver. Okay. I'm with you. Okay. So then that way the company knows it can never have more exposure than what the face value is. Okay. So that's what the whole life is in terms of our perspective and why we can pay out the freedom of choice so quick. Now, the other thing about whole life is that it has, if you notice right here, it has cash value that starts to accumulate after three years. So after three years, a certain amount of money is accumulated in cash value and it goes like this. And then every year it gets steeper and steeper until it hockey sticks. But the amount of cash value that's generated is never going to uh, meet or reach the face value of the policy because that cash value that's accumulating is what? The proceeds of the investments of the money that we're putting away. So if you pay me $150 a month, I'm taking a certain percentage of that as the insurance company and I'm investing it into whatever investment vehicle I want, guaranteeing a return. And that's what's used to pay you if it's cash value. The reserves that somebody mentioned before, that's what's used to pay out the death benefits. Now, there's four different bands of whole life. You have your base band, you have your preferred life, executive and select life. So you have four different bands. We issue that policy anywhere from the ages of zero. So before you're even born up to the age of 80 at age 60 or older, the max amount that you can purchase from us is thirty four thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars. But if you're under the age of 60, there's no limit on how much insurance you want to buy. OK, there's also something called paid up value that says, hey, at a certain point, let's say I've paid up. I bought a twenty five thousand dollar policy. I've paid on it for a number of years. I don't want to pay on it anymore. You can take a paid up option that says, hey, at this point, the face value, which was going to be twenty five thousand, you've paid enough into it. And now the face value is twelve thousand you could take that paid up face value and no longer have to pay us any money. That policy will stay in effect and when you die, we'll pay out 10,000. Okay, so that's the way that works. Now, it never expires and the rates never go up on a whole life policy. So as long as the policy is in force, it will pay out no matter how or when you die. The number one thing that affects those rates are gonna be your age, your medical situation or your health and whether or not you smoke tobacco. Okay, that's whole life. The next product is a 10 year renewable and convertible term. So you had whole life that pays out no matter how or when you die. And now you have a term product that will pay out if you die within the term period. So it's a 10 year term meaning that for 10 years, the rates will remain the same. And then after those 10 years, if you keep the policy, the rates will go up. So I want you to think about it. A whole life policy, let's say costs this much, a term 10 year policy costs this much. So there's a huge disparity, but every time the term renews, the cost goes up. So I'm paying the same amount here forever, as long as I want the policy in the whole life. And then all of a sudden my term 10 year term renews twice and now up to 20 years, 30 years, the cost of that term will exceed the cost of this whole life every month. This is why people who are veterans or who were service members, when they transition and they transition into civilian life, they transition their service members group life insurance into a veteran group life insurance policy. Usually what will happen is they'll kill the policy because the cost of that policy gets worse and worse. It goes higher and higher every three years. And at some point they just can't afford it anymore. So they kill it. Now they have nothing. That's why a lot of veterans don't have any insurance at all because they were relying on, well, one, they're relying on the veterans group life insurance policy. And two, they don't realize that the military or the uh, department of defense or the government won't pay anything out at all unless they have a VGLI but most of them stop their VGLI because it gets to be too expensive. So the other thing with the 10 year renewable and convertible is in its name. So it's renewable, which means every 10 years you can renew it and it's convertible, meaning at any point up until the age of 63, 
you can convert that policy into a whole life policy. Now, I did that all the time when I was in production. I would look at their portfolio. I'd see they have a 10-year RMC. I would talk them through why they should convert that policy. Okay, I'm not going to teach that here because that's a whole other uh, avenue of approach, but we could do it. And I used to do it a lot. Now, you can issue it from 15 to 60. However, it expires at 65. Most of our veterans are late 50s, early 60s, which means we don't offer the term of the tenure RNC, renewable and convertible term policy, because it expires at 65. And if they're over 60, I can't sell it to them at all. Okay. And as I go through this, you have a question about these policies. You got to put your hand up so I can catch you for it. Okay. The next one is the accidental death benefits improved in all states. It's issued from age five to 64. And what it says is if you die in an accident of any kind, we'll pay out a maximum of $200,000. At the time that you submit the application, you're gonna pick how much the payout's gonna be. But that accidental death benefit does not apply once they hit 70. So let's say I'm 35 years old, I buy a $25,000 whole life and I get $200,000 of accidental death benefit. Everything looks good, everybody's happy until I turn 70 and then that $200,000 goes away. So if I'm talking to somebody who's in their 60s I'm going to say you do realize that you think you have $225,000 in coverage, but the reality is you only have 25 because once you hit 70, that other $200,000 is no longer eligible to be paid out. And they'll go, oh my gosh, well, I've told my family for 20 years they're going to get over a quarter million dollars. I'm like, that's exactly why I'm here. Let's put some whole life in place to try to offset that. And we also have waiver of premium. Waiver of premium means basically it waives the premiums when the insured is disabled, total disability. The way that it works is you have to be totally disabled for six months and then you can apply. And then if we approve it, then you, uh, we will go back and refund you the last six months of payments that you made. Now, total disability to us means that you're not able to work in your usual business or occupation. So let's say, for example, I'm skiing on the slopes and I get into an accident with a tree branch and it damages my trachea and I can't speak anymore. Okay, So I'm in the insurance business. I teach. My whole job is my voice. Well, not the whole job, but the majority of it is my voice. If I lose my voice for any reason, I could claim total disability under this plan. But if I wanted to go out and get another job, maybe where I wash cars or sweep streets or I don't know, something that doesn't require my voice, I'm still eligible for the waiver of premium because it says where well, you're not able to work at your usual business or occupation. Next thing is the senior graded, whoops, senior graded whole life. Remember we talked about a whole life product from zero up to 59. At age 60 and above, you get a senior graded whole life. Okay, what the heck is that? So think of it this way. <clears throat> if I were 60 years old and you try to sell a policy to me versus my son, who's 30, who's more likely to die sooner, my son or me? Probably me, right? Because I'm closer to the average death age. Uh, in North America, for men, it is 76. And for women, it's about 81. They live five years longer, typically. So I'm 16 years away from dying according to the statistics, and my son is 35 years away from dying. So the company is going to have more risk by selling a policy to me than my son on average. Make sense, everybody? So that being the case, if they didn't have a way to reduce their risk in the senior market, they just wouldn't sell to seniors. They can make the argument no one's going to hold them accountable, right? But they do want to sell to seniors because seniors have money, but they've got to figure out a way to mitigate the risk. And that's where you come up with a graded policy. So the first thing is with a senior, the cap is 34,999. So now I know no matter who I'm selling to, if they're 16 and older, I know what my total exposure potentially could be. It's no more than 35,000 per person. Then on top of that, they know that a certain number of applicants actually will die in year one, year two, and year three after the application has been submitted. So rather than pay out the full 34,999, what they do is they say, okay, we need to mitigate our risk. So if you die as a senior in year one, 
the most we're, we'll pay out is 25 percent year 250 year 375 percent because the actuary tables tell us that if you as a senior live at least three years after policy is issued you're probably going to live for at least 10 more years somebody who lives 10 years will get the majority of the premium in for the cap at 34,999. Okay, so that's how we mitigate risk and allow ourselves to sell into the senior market. Otherwise, we wouldn't sell at all. So if we look at the next page, it shows us the example I just talked about. You're 125, you're 250, you're 375 percent. Brooke, what can we do for you? Um, I'm just wondering, I'm sure you'll show us this, how to set up a graded whole life policy. I'm never going to show you that. I never want you to sell any. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to show you that <laughs> two of next week. Okay. okay? Thanks. <clears throat> the next policy we have is called the B2000. It's a special uh, accidental death benefit it's issued from ages five to 72, and it has a static payout for accident, auto, and common carrier. It's ten, twenty-five, and fifty thousand dollars respectively. Okay. After that, you have Children's Rider and Head Start. Okay? I do not like the Children's Rider. I only do it in one circumstance. So what I'm gonna do is talk about Head Start. So basically, if you talk to anybody and they're about to have a child or they have a child, we can issue a policy to them, very, very inexpensive, and we can include something called the Guaranteed Insurability Option. What that means is every, once the child turns 25 years old on that birthday and every three years after that, they're eligible to purchase an additional $25,000 without being required to submit any medical information. So in effect, we're given the ability to have access to what is that, $150,000 of coverage? And they're going to have to pay whatever the rates are, but we're not going to ask for their medical information. So let's think that through for a minute, right? Let me turn this off. Let's understand what's happening here. So we're insurance agents. We're talking to somebody. Let's take uh, Amanda. I always keep pivoting to Amanda. Amanda, you have children, right? Do you have anybody young? Yeah, I have an 11 year old, a 13 year old and a 15 year old. Okay, perfect. So I would sell this to Amanda and I say, Amanda, so what I want you to think about is if anything were to happen to your kids now, you're gonna have to pay for the funeral fall expenses, right? Mm -hmm. You probably don't have $10,000 in a bank account sitting around for that particular thing. You certainly don't have it a bag underneath your bed. But that's not even the important part, Amanda. What I want you to think about are your grandchildren the future children that your kids are potentially going to have. And she's going to go like, oh, what do you mean? She's going to sit like this, right? And she's going to like, oh, I'm interested. What are you talking about? I say, Amanda, imagine a situation where you can guarantee that your grandchildren will be protected in the future if anything were to happen to your children. Well, what do you mean? I said, well, what we would do is we'd set up a head start for your kids. And we would give them a guaranteed insurability option that says that your children, when they take ownership of the policy at age 25, and every three years after that, they're eligible to purchase another $25,000 in coverage, regardless of their medical condition. And then she'll say, well, okay, that, I mean, that sounds good, but why is that relevant? And then I would ask some questions. Do you have any history of heart disease in your family or any history of breast cancer or anything like that? And a lot of people will have that. And I'll say, think about this. If we set this policy up with your kids, your kids who may be exposed or may have a predisposition to having heart issues or maybe breast cancer, or the case may be, we will never use that as a reason to deny them coverage. So what that means is when your kids turn 25 and they start thinking about getting kids of their own, even if you had the cancer gene or the gene for heart attacks or whatever, they can still get insurance. Whereas if we didn't have this in place and they try to apply for insurance, they may get denied or declined. And the issue there is not for your kids. 
it's because they're having your grandchildren and they're trying to protect themselves the same way you and I are talking. We can set them up for their future right now today, 25 years in advance. And by the right. way, Amanda, it's like 15 bucks a month for each child, if that. So now Amanda's thinking to herself, well, you're saying I can protect my grandchildren. Yeah, because the policy would be owned by your kids. If they died, they probably named your grandchildren as beneficiaries. So every time I have this conversation with, particularly with women, and we talk about breast cancer gene and all that, they say to themselves, oh my gosh, there is a way to ensure that my children have coverage in the future, regardless of their medical condition. And I say, yes, there absolutely is. And invariably, I would say about 95% of the time, the women sign up immediately. Give me the head starts because it's so inexpensive and it really okay. is looking into the future for those grandchildren. So what do you think, Amanda, as I described it, does it seem like it's something that would be worthwhile for you? So is this considered a whole life thing where it yes. builds value? No, so it, it, it's a whole life policy. It builds value. Absolutely. It just includes the guaranteed insurability option, which is yes. the thing that would protect your grandchildren 25 years from now. Yeah, and super cheap. Oh, I would totally do that. So you told it, and now you guys are starting to build it. And what That's you're doing, if you're young <laughs> in this business, you're actually creating your future clients because you keep in contact with that family. And then what happens is the children uh, of Amanda have families and now they need to protect themselves and they get married. They have husbands and wives. You can actually continue to create your own lead pool through one family, starting with Amanda. So if you stay in this business long enough, you can see yourself actually doing that. Yeah. Uh, Melissa, your hand is up. What can I do for you? I just have when it says that um, they're it's issued ages zero to seventeen, but then it also indicates has to be filled out with a Head Start program. So if you have a let's say a sixteen year old, they're not going to be in a Head Start program. So what does that look like? No, they're in a Head Start program. The Head Start is a nomenclature; it's not an actual oh. thing that you qualify for. And the reason that it's zero to seventeen is once you turn eighteen, you have to own your own policy. Oh, she's so, talking about. So they have to be like, and so let's say for example, I'm you call me, um, you're you're the producer, and you call me, and I have a 16 year old son that I want yes. to enroll in this program. I can't. Is that correct? Because they're not in it. He's he's a junior in high school, and isn't. No, he can't program. enroll. It's zero to seventeen. Okay, so what does that mean when it says the child coverage questionnaire has to be filled out with a Head Start program? Oh, what, does, you know, just ask all me, that, what does that mean? All that means is that we have to ask medical questions. And I'll show you that on Tuesday. It oh, doesn't matter okay. what age you are. Everybody has to answer the questions. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Brooke, what can I do for you? Um, she was talking about the Head Start program that our preschoolers are in. That's why she was confused. Our four-year-olds and three-year-olds go into Head Start program. Yeah, that's but a government program that's funded. This we call. I wish we didn't call it Head Start, but that's yeah. the name they came up with. It's just a concept, just like selling into the veteran market is a concept. Whereas the reality is, you can sell to anybody who qualifies. That, that wasn't sense? why my hand was up, though. My hand was up because what is the base? Even though it adds twenty-five thousand dollars every three years, what's the base amount? Or do they choose that? And then that's, you go over all they, that. And they choose the base amount and we will see what happens with how much they can give their child initially. Okay. So we'll get to that. Okay. Yep. Uh, Virginia Robertson already unmuted. I love it. What can I do for you? I learned. So if in your grandparent scenario, if the grandparent buys the policy like I, if I bought the policy for my son, in case he had grandchildren, that deal. Is it my son or me as a grandparent that are, is able to take cash value out of the? It's whoever owns the policy. So here's what typically will happen. You'll, I would buy it for my son at, let's say, 10 years old. He's not going to take it when he's 18 because guess what? He doesn't work. He's going to college, whatever the case may be. He doesn't actually take over the payments until I either tell him, hey, I want you to own this or until he's starting to think about a family. Because when that happens, I'm going to say, hey, we should give this to you. You should make the payment on it. 
right? Because it's going to be for your kids in the event of your death. So we need to change the beneficiary to those children. I no longer need to be the beneficiary, do I? I'm the grandparent. I don't need the benefit of the money because I bought it really not even to pay for his funeral. I bought it for him to protect his kids and his family in the future. So I want him to assume ownership of it at some point. However, I don't have to. I could keep it forever if I wanted to do that. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm not explaining what I mean. I'm not I'm not really talking about the beneficiary as much as normally the owner. I, I thought that the owner of the policy is the person that can take cash value out of it before, you know, not not in the case that of the correct. Job, pull cash value out, right? If if I decide so normally I would guess I would assume that I could take cash value out of it because I'm the one that bought it for my yes, kids. That's true. My grandchildren. Anyway, but could I at some point even if I uh, and I still own the policy, could I allow my son to take the cash value out? No, no, because it's it's only for you. you. Only you can take the cash value out if you're the owner. So what you would do as a parent is you would transfer ownership of that policy to your son in this example, so that he has it and he continues to make the payments and he can take the cash value out when he wants. Okay. Okay. Awesome. So I'm a big believer in the head start. Trust me, a huge believer, because it, it, if you explain it the way I did or some semblance of that, people get it. They're like, oh, my gosh, I can really help my future generations out. People are more likely to do that than get insurance for themselves. It's crazy. Right. But it works. So why not leverage it? OK, so that is the head start. Then we have the children's writer. I said I didn't like this one, but I do use this in one circumstance. And that is when somebody tells me, hey, I've got more than one kid. I can't afford to pay a bunch of head starts. And then in that case, I say, okay, no problem. I'm going to give you a writer, but understand the writer is not an insurance policy on your children. A writer sits on your policy as the parent, and it pays out $10,000 one time, and that's if the, one of your children dies. Okay, and it doesn't have a guaranteed insurability option, all the rest of it. Now, what it does have is it can convert to 50,000 at age 21, and it's guaranteed to convert regardless of health or habits. So there is some upside to it. So I would include it if people have kids, but I'm going to try to do the head start because I think downstream that has much more value and you're taking care of that family more than just the children's rider. Okay, but if you are talking to parents, which in the veteran market, uh, they're usually older, but if you're talking to friends or whatever, anybody younger that has children, you want to start with a head start, show them the value proposition on that. And if they can't do that because they have too many kids or they can't afford it, then try to include the children's rider. You're not going to make a whole lot of money on either one of these, just so you guys know, you will make some, don't get me wrong, but it's the totality of the portfolio that you're offering the family that's important. You're taking care of everyone in that family, okay? The next thing we have is the term to 65 and the term to 100. Uh, you can see these. We typically don't sell these anymore, but they might be around, and they are exactly what they state. That will give you a term to 65, and then at 65, boom, it's going to change. It expires, or term to 100, same concept. But we typically do 10-year RNCs. We don't use these two products, but they're still around. Next thing is a 15 or 30 year decreasing term, which basically is protecting your mortgage, which sounds really good 40 years ago. But Brooke, do you know how long people stay in their homes before they physically move on average? Um, probably like 10 years. It's less than seven years. Wow. That's one thing. So people aren't buying homes and staying in them forever. And those that do stay longer than seven years, what are they typically doing, Brooke, with their mortgage? Um, what did you say? I'm sorry. I don't understand the question. I said supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Yeah, I got that one. I, I'm good at that one. Okay, good. No, what I said is, what are people who stay in their homes that they own for more than seven years, what do they typically do with their mortgage? Um, they sell it. 
They sell their homes, <laughs> but if they stayed in their home, they refinance their mortgage. Oh, they refinance it. That's because typically <laughs> when you buy, you're you're usually younger and you got to buy higher rates and there's a number of things that go in, but you have an interest rate. After you've built up equity in your house for a while, what you want to do is get some of that equity out to either do home improvements, pay off loans or do whatever. So you refinance and hopefully you refinance at a lower rate. Lower. Oh, that ha <clears throat> every single time that happens, it kills this policy. Because what this policy is doing is a straight line depreciation. It's saying either at 15 or 30 years, every year that goes by, the value of that term product decreases until it gets to the end of the period, 15 or 30, and then the value is zero and you stop paying on it. But that worked <clears throat> when my dad bought a house, but it doesn't work in today's world. So you very rarely see that anymore. Then you have 20 year level term for children's education. And then you have this one. Where's Adam? Adam, are you there? Adam? Yes, sir. Adam? There you are, All right, Adam. Here you go. Here's the answer to your question. The baseline product for the A7-1000, otherwise known as A7-1, that's how everyone talks about it, says that if you go to the emergency room, we're going to pay you $50 just for going to the emergency room. If you spend the night in the hospital, we're going to pay you $100 a day that you're in there, up to 365 days for each injury that was, or each incident is what it should say, that happens. If you're in the ICU, we'll pay you $200 a day for 14 days. If you're in the ICU longer, then we just fall down to the $100 a day. If you were to die, <clears throat> the baseline payout for by accident is 10,000, for auto accident it's 20, for common carrier it is 50. For a child, it's two, four, and 10 because the child typically doesn't have an economic impact to the family, so it's really to pay for the funeral expenses. That is the base product for the A7-1. When we talk about double, triple, quadruple, quintuple, we're multiplying the base times two, three, four, five, or in Florida, sextuple times six. So when I say triple family, which is where we start when we build the plan, what we're saying is we're taking the base and we're saying, okay, Go to the emergency room, $150, right? Three times 50, $300 a day for hospital. And then I'm multiplying this accidental. So that becomes 30, 60 and $150,000. Individual means only one person is being covered. Family means more than one. It doesn't matter if it's 10, doesn't matter if it's two, as long as it's more than one, it's considered family. So the rate doesn't go up if we're covering 10 people in our family versus two people. All right. However, the A71 product on the family only covers people listed on the application. <clears throat> so if you have five people in your family and you list three of them, you don't list the other two. They don't get the benefit of the uh, A71 product. So Adam, is that answer your question it does yes perfect now you're going to ask me well but why do you start in triple versus whatever so i'm going to show you why in this thing here we'll go back to the plan generator we know on recommended i said triple right so that triple when i look at the plan itself that means i'm going to pay out 30 60 and 90. Well, that red number is the sum of the whole life for both Helen and Tom and the 60,000 for each one of them on auto accident. The reason I started triple is if I didn't start a triple, then that 410,000, say I started at single, that 410,000 when I allocate the remaining looks like this. Well, no, it doesn't look like that. What did I do wrong here? Oh, because I went here. Sorry about that. So go to dollar a day, drop that down to five, allocate the remaining. I think that'll work. So remember, is that 400 and something thousand? And now drop by 100,000. Because it's taking that number and driving it through the roof, right? So that's why I always start at triple. So this should be, uh, if I said single family, 
and allocate the remaining. Then the payout here would be 369. So you lose like 50, 60,000. So what we're trying to do is get that red number as high as possible because logically or not logically, emotionally, the red number is the one that people remember, right? So if I take this same thing, still at 304.17, if I did this, if I went to the plan generator and changed this from single family to quintuple, and then I allocated the remaining, the price point remains the same at 304.17, but look what happens to that red number. It now goes back huge up to 481,000. So you can actually have the price the same and have that red number move up or down. When we move the red number up and down, we're taking the face value of the whole life and we're moving it up or down. Because that's where the money comes from, right? And the way you know that, if you go back to the plan generator and you look at this, you go, okay, quintuple family, it's $22.33. So if I move this down to single family, now it's only $467 which means I have $17 left over. When I allocate it, it's going to put it into the whole life for Tom and Helen. So most people don't look at that whole life and immediately think to themselves, oh, I want to get the maximum payout. What they're looking at is the big red number. So you want to drive that as high as possible because they could potentially die in an accident and that would be paid out. So that is the reason I start in the middle with triple because triple is uh, 150 a day, <clears throat> or if we're going to the uh, emergency room, it's $150 payout and it's $300 a day. So if they survive an accident, they're gonna make some money. I can't tell you the number of times I have talked to people and they're like, oh my God, I wish I had that. My son was in an accident and I had to take 10 days off of work and I only had five days of PTO. And I said, exactly. If your son had been under this program, I would have paid you $300 a day for those 10 days, you would have got a check for $3,000. And they're like, well, I only make like $75 a day because some people I talk to don't make much money. And I go, perfect. See, you have a plan now that's in place that anything happens to you and your family, you're actually, and you survive, you're actually going to make money off of it. Melissa, how can I help you? Just so that I, so it makes sense in my mind, when you're choosing the single, double, triple, the reason that we're doing the triple, for example, is when we're explaining it for the script, we're saying if you and your spouse die in an accident, because we're taking those three numbers, we're taking the, the whole policy plus the accident for two people. Is that correct? Because that's yeah. why we're choosing that triple. Well, the reason we're choosing triple is it's in the middle and the recommended is in the middle at $5 a day. But it's two people. So... It doesn't matter if it's, it's not the, it's not the number of people, it's the value that you're going to get. So there's three factors. So let's, let's do this again. So if I pick triple family and I allocate the remaining, so now I know I'm going to spend $304, right? right? So the first factor is how much am I going to get right here? If I'm in an accident and I'm in the hospital, I'm getting $300 a day. If it's a family, then anybody that's on the application that I listed, if any of them are in an accident and they're in the hospital, they're going to get paid three hundred dollars a day. So that's factor one. Okay, sorry. Factor yes. two is I think what you're referring to is this big red number here. Right. That's driven by the whole life, assuming that they both die in an accident. That's that's here, right? One seventy three with one sixteen plus sixty plus sixty gets you four ten. So there's two different sides of that equation. One is if you survive, how much you get paid if you're in the hospital because of the accident. And if you die by an accident, the number one way people die in accidents is car accidents. And that's why we use the sum of auto accident plus any cause of death. Does that answer your question? It's still not making sense by mind why we choose triple for a two person family, but. I'll go with it and I'll just say that that's what we choose. Wait, wait. So, so you're asking why did I choose triple for the family? Yeah, because there's only two people in the family with no okay, children. Okay, so they're okay. I get it now. Like, that's where there's my no, brain is going. 
Right. There's no relationship to single, double, triple, quadruple, quintuple to the number of people in the family. No relationship. You could have 10 people in your family. You can have two. The reason that it's single, double, triple is we're multiplying the base times one, two, three, four, five, or six. So a triple means I'm multiplying the emergency room benefit by three. So that's why it says $150. So again, there's no relationship to the number of people in a family. As long as it's more than two, then it's called family. If there's okay, only so one. That's the benefit that we're family. providing them then instead of versus the number of people in the family. Yes. Okay. Got it. That, no, just clicked. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Awesome. All right. So then we kind of went into that. <clears throat> so there's a lot of power here. But here's a key for everybody. You got to have your accidental and health license to sell this. So I think in the beginning, I asked people in the uh, preliminary aptitude assessment, how many people actually have their life license? Some of you said, you, or I'm sorry, your accidental license. Some of you said no. You need to get it. Talk to your upline, they'll walk you through it. Because if you think about what happens here, See how this has value? That number is 410,000, okay? Everyone agrees that this is the triple 410,000. We're all happy, right? But let's assume you don't have your A71 license. Here's what happens. You can't add that A71. So then this happens. Now you can allocate the remaining, but when you go to show this screen, uh-oh, you got all this blank space. The number is a little bit less because it put all the money into a whole life product. But the moment you have blank spaces, what will the client do? The client will say, well, how come, I'm, well, how come I don't have anything for hospital benefits? Or how come I don't have, what happens if I'm an auto accident? I'm not going to get paid out anything. You see, it, it ends, <clears throat> the system is designed to expect you to get your life and your accidental health license so that you can sell everything. If you don't have your accidental health, it doesn't allow you to change this. So then you're showing a screen that actually is to your detriment. So please, if you don't have one, get it. Yes, Ben, what can I do for you? I'm Are you talking something outside the 240 and the 215? If you, have the, you said accidental health. I mean, are you talking about just the 240 and the 215, right? Well, the I don't know. Life? What do you mean by 240 and 215? Uh, 240 is your health life. The 215 is your oh, life. Yeah, in your state, that's correct. No. Okay, my bad. Are, are you you have your health you license, license, you're good. So sorry? You you're good. Okay. All right. That's it. I'm sorry. You just I, need I your health license. Up. No, no. <laughs> Only need, so for all of us, <clears throat> you need your life, obviously. In some states, they combine health, accident, and life all together. In some states, they do uh, life and then an accident and health. And in some states, they don't even separate accident. They just assume it's going to be part of health. So you will know what you need in your state. And if you don't have an accident or health license, get with your upline and let them know that you're going to have to get it. Okay. Whew. All right. So let's finish this off here. We're right here. We've now exhausted that. We have a couple more to go. One is the A74 uh, or the A74000. All that is is an accident policy but it's capped. It just says, <clears throat> if you're disabled due to the accident, we'll pay you hundred dollars a week up to 26 weeks, which to me is not that much. Uh, and, but if you die due to the accident, then we automatically either pay 10, 25 or 50. So it's nice to have, but in reality, the A71 is much more valuable, which is why we include it in the script. Then you have critical illness and lump sum cancer. So critical illness says, hey, if you <clears throat> have a heart attack or stroke or end stage renal failure, or even a more major organ transplant or a total loss of hearing, total loss of sight, we will pay out either 10, 25 or 50, whatever they signed up for. But it's a one-time payout. So if I signed up for this thing at $50,000, I have a heart attack then, and I survive, <clears throat> they're gonna pay out $50,000. If I have a second heart attack, they don't pay out anything. So again, if I'm talking to anybody who has a history of heart disease, any issues in their family, 
I'm going to include this in their package because I'm a good insurance agent. I want to make sure the family's taken care of. I also have lump sum cancer plan payout. It can be sold from 18 to 64. It has three amounts, 10, 25, or 50. And it only pays out again, the same as critical illness on the first diagnosis. The cancer it doesn't cover is typically skin cancer, carcinoma, and uh, stage one of Hodgkin's disease, stage A of prostate cancer, or melanoma that's diagnosed as Clark's level one, two, or even Breslow less than 0.75 millimeters. So if you tell me that you, and I will ask, you know, is there any history of cancer in your family? Oh my God, yeah, my mom and my grandmother had breast cancer. Have you been diagnosed? No, I haven't. Boom, I'm giving you this cancer policy. I'm going to give you this because it's going to take care of your family in the event anything happens to you. Can you imagine if you get breast cancer, you don't die from it, but you got to go through everything that you got to go through with breast cancer, everything. Someone's got to take care of the kids if you're younger mom while you're going to chemo or whatever it is that's being done. Maybe you want to get the good hair uh, wig or whatever. I mean, and I know because I've been in a family where there's been cancer, there's a lot of expenses that happen that the health insurance company never pays for. So if somebody's diagnosed with cancer and I give them $50,000, let's assume it's end stage cancer. Let's just assume that's the case, worst case scenario. And I have this in place and I've sold them a life insurance policy. <clears throat> what that does is it says, I'll be right with you, man. What that does in that scenario says, you know what, when you die, your family is going to be taken care of because the life insurance will pay out. But if you get diagnosed with end stage cancer, we're going to give you $50,000. You're going to live your best possible life with your family up until the time you die. For your family, that's life changing. Right? I mean, for any one of us, if I gave you $50,000 telling you that the doctor said you're going to die in six months and I gave you 50 K, I guarantee you, you're going to live your best life with your family. Enjoy those things, whatever they might be before your quality of life deteriorates. Yes, Amanda, what can I do for you? Does it have to be terminal? No. No, so not necessarily terminal. No, I'm just, I gave you an example where if something is terminal, you're oh, getting yeah, better ahead of time life. as opposed to waiting in, for the life insurance policy to pay out. Okay. Thank you. So if I knew I had terminal cancer and they paid me $50,000, I'm going to do something with my family before I become so incapacitated that I can do nothing. That's life-changing stuff. I mean, that is you as an insurance agent taking care of that family. Last one is that lump cancer plan. And then after that, oh my gosh, that's it. Those are the products that we sell. However, However, let's go back here and look at this thing and say to ourselves, well, Sam, all I see is whole life and then some. OK, so let me walk you through how this works. When you're in the plan generator, your whole life product is I'm sorry, your A71 product is first. So it's right here because that's the one we want you to start with. We want you to include that 100 percent of the time. Then you have your whole life. You have your 10-year RMC, otherwise known as your 10-year renewable convertible, and then you have accidental death benefit. So why do we have it set up this way? Well, if you want to sell a 10-year RMC, typically you're selling it to protect against the loss of income because if uh, Tom dies, his income dies with him, and we know he's getting about $9,100 a month. So if we add that in there, we can protect against final expense, credit card, monthly income, or even mortgage protection. And then usually the person who makes the most money we put on top, because if we do that for monthly income, we can do a second 10 year renewable and convertible to protect against the house writer, right? Because we said it cost X amount per month. You multiply the times 12, I said it was 3000 a month, right? That we were paying for the mortgage. Now we're protecting against that. So let's say I did all of this. Everything looks good. And for Helen, we gave her a 10 year RNC. She made all that money. There we go. Now the cost is 444. Okay. So remember, I taught you we're going to allocate the remaining. And now it gives us all these options to allocate from. Well, we don't want to allocate from the 10 year RNCs because those are for a specific reason. 
to give enough money to cover for the loss of income or to pay for the mortgage in the event that Tom dies. Okay, so I want to allocate out of the whole life product. So it's going to take $70 out of each one. I'm going to allocate. And now the whole life is 66 and 75 respectively. But my money is still at 30417. When I go and look at this and I present the plan, it now looks like that. And now it includes this little monthly income. So, okay, if I click on the freedom of choice, it gives me that thing with my name on it. Okay, that sounds good. But if I click down here, <clears throat> actually, let me do this. If I hit the down arrows, if I click on monthly income, rather, it shows me a check for Tom for $9,167, and it says one of 12. That means if Tom dies, Helen could actually take that money once a month to cover the loss of income, or she will have the option to take it all at once, not have to wait for the 12 months to pay out. If Helen dies, then Tom gets $20,000 a month because this one was protecting against the loss of income. And then you can actually show this to the client. But again, you're in the veteran market. So more often than not, we're not talking about protecting income or protecting families. But if you're with your friends and you're doing this or you're with anybody else or you go into any other market, you will typically want to help that family ensure they're protected against the loss of income or uh, loss of mortgage in the event a loved one dies. And you can actually show that that's very powerful to look at that and say to yourself, hey, if Helen dies, Tom's going to get $20,000 a month in addition to whatever we were gonna pay out for the freedom of choice. Does that make sense to everybody? So going back here to the plan generator, I talked about now you have whole life and you have whole life. Remember those bands that I were talking about? I'll be right with you guys. The bands are listed here, right? So that's EX for executive. And the other three bands are listed as well, depending on how much is in this coverage amount. Yes, Adam, what can I do for you? Sorry, I was uh, confused at first, but I forgot the original um, dollar amounts we put in. I'm all good. Okay, Virginia, what can I do for you? Okay, so if you decide on the, you said that you could take the payouts uh, for the monthly income at once. And if you yes. decide to do that, is that amount discounted? No. Okay. No. We, we never discount. <clears throat> Just like if you decide to pay on an annual basis for our policies, we're not going to give you a discount because you gave us all the money <laughs> ahead of time, as opposed to every month. <clears throat> we never discount. No insurance company, well, I won't say no, but we never discount. No, no. Well, no, what I meant was, I'm sorry, if you if the payments were 10000 a month, Mm -hmm. um, would you get any, but you took it all at once, would they give you less because you're no. taking it all at once? That's what no, I, mean. I, I answered that question. I said no. And then I went on to another concept, but oh, yeah, okay. we never discount one way or the other, whether it's premiums or payouts, you're going to get paid out exactly what you say, what we said you were going to get paid. Brooke, what can I do for you? Um, This is the 10 year RNC. That's what you're calling it. It's the 10 year renewable and convertible. Term oh, okay. product. So if they have to renew this particular part of the policy every 10 years? Yes. And okay. American Income will automatically renew it. So it doesn't really matter? No, it does matter because if the client gets the next bill and it used to be 200 bucks and now it's 250, they may say that's too much money and they'll call you or they'll call American Income and try to cancel it. But the reason we automatically renew it was we don't want them to lose the coverage they're expecting to get. Because here's what happens, year nine, year eight, you forget, you know the money's taken out, but you don't remember its term or it's gonna renew. You don't remember any of that. All you'll know is instead of 200, now it's 250. It goes up based on inflation? No, it goes up because your age is now 10 years further. So if you bought it when you were 30, now you're 40. 
in order for us to mitigate our risk, you, you, we have to increase the premium. That's why I told you when you have a whole life, it remains the same because we've already calculated the total amount of money we need to get paid to offset the payout. But the term starts lower and it just creeps up, creeps up. And at some point it actually passes what this monthly cost would be. The whole reason is everybody mathematically to understand the insurance company, if it's 50, 150, a million doesn't matter. The insurance company, if you live long enough, will always get the exact amount of money, whether it's a whole life or whether it's a term policy. So if I bought a term policy today and I bought a whole life policy <clears throat> at the same time and I live for another 50 years, the total amount of money I would pay on the term would equal the total amount of money I paid on whole life because the term would renew and I'd end up paying more money on the back end. Does that make sense? Work? Yes. Okay. So Sam, you're telling me that these are the products that we sell, but I only see whole life and tenure RNC. Oh, I see ADB. So I can add ADB in there. I see that and I see it for Helen, but where are all these cancer products you're talking about? Oh, okay. So here's what you do. You take your cursor, you go to the left, you click on additional products. And when you do, there is the cancer products. There's the special B2000. There's a spouse writer for Tom. And then for Helen, Helen actually has a 10 year RNC. And the reason that we have it there is because there's not enough room here. So we gave two to Tom, but if we decide Helen needs a house payment writer, we can click on additional products, go down to Helen, do the 10 year RNC, there's the house payment writer. So we could add it in here. It's just additional screen because there's not enough real estate on the first screen. However, in the beginning of your career, more often than not, what you're going to sell will probably look like that. And then you allocate the remaining. And there you go. Straightforward, simple, right in the middle. That's what's recommended at $5 a day. That's probably what you're going to sell. The rest of the stuff is available. The more confident you get and the more situations you find yourself in where you need to kind of craft a solution that meets the needs of the family. Good insurance agents, this is what they do. And remember, we have a responsibility as a fiduciary to ensure we're putting the financial interest of the client ahead of our own. So we want to make sure, regardless of whatever money we might get paid, that the program we're putting in place meets what they need. Now, none of us are in Canada, but if we were, we would actually have to download <clears throat> every presentation because at any time in Canada, the tax authority can require you as an agent to justify why you sold something to a client. In the United States, we don't have to do that. You don't have to justify. If somebody wants to buy something, you can sell it to them. But in Canada, it's a little bit of a different government, a little bit of political viewpoint, and they want to make sure that everything has justification for why you're presenting it to the client. And lo and behold, that is the script. That is HP Pro as it runs the script. And now all of you are policy experts. Brooke, what can I do for you? Um, when will we figure out, like, if you're asking, is that one of the questions? Cancer, is cancer part of your family history? Somewhere well, in your, is that one of the questions on the, like the four or whatever? It's, no, it's not. When you ask somebody, do they have any medical uh, stuff in their lifetime? Right, those four questions. The one that Don't might cover the answer maybe. says, have you had any health issues in your lifetime? Oh yes, I've had cancer. I might say, well, do you have the cancer gene? Does your family have a history of cancer? Oh, yes, we do. Immediately in my mind, I probably, I can't sell them a cancer policy, but I can think about their kids and walk through the Head Start concept with them. Right. And also you might have gotten their child's name out of the. Sure. I already got their child's name when I did the survey, right? Because I talked about adult children and underage children. Now, if they if I ask the question of, hey, have you had any health issues in your lifetime? They go, no, never had any. And I'm like, OK, what about your parents? I, I might do that because I've been around a while. Right. Well, does your family have any history of anything? Oh, yeah. My mom has a my grandmother had this, you know, what I mean? heart conditions, breast cancer. And immediately I'm going to think, OK, have you ever been diagnosed? No. Then let's get you a cancer policy or let's get you a critical illness policy. 
You have to, you don't have to do it yet, but as you get more and more sophisticated and experienced, you're going to want to do these things because what you want to do is give them the portfolio that's best for them. Yeah. Right? How powerful is it going to be if, Brooke, if I call you up seven years from now and say, Brooke, I just want to call and tell you that, you know, Laura, she just got diagnosed with cancer and they just sent me a $50,000 check. Laura hasn't died yet, but because of what you did, because of your forethought and explaining it to the client, they now have $50,000 they can use to offset the medical expenses or to go on trips or whatever they want to use the money for. There's no cap. There's no constraints on what they can use that money for. How are you going to feel if you get that call? Really good. You're going to feel like really my good. Job. Exactly. And that you weren't slamming something to somebody that doesn't need it, but as I said, in the beginning, we teach you the basics and the script. So at least you can get started. And as you get more comfortable with the different products and understand different scenarios, you'll craft solutions that meet the needs of your client. Wow. We went through a lot today. I mean, I think I yeah. did a lot of walking. We didn't do any breakout rooms. So holy mackerel, I spoke for what? Three and a half hours straight. So now, you know, HP pro, you know, your script and you know, your products. So the only thing I need from you, you got to practice. You got to practice because you've got to navigate this. You've got to navigate HP Pro. You got to navigate Zoom. I mean, we've got to figure out how to unmute, right? As a class, we need to work on that just a tad. But HP Pro, we need to know how to navigate with that, how to put those uh, answers in, or not answers, but I'm sorry, put in the products that we're going to select, build a plan, follow the script, understand what plans we're going to show. And then in some cases, if they tell us it's too much, what are we going to do to overcome the pricing objection? Because it's the number one objection we'll ever get. So practice, practice, practice. That's what we need to do. The homework for tonight is what? Number one, we need to confirm that we actually have eApp downloaded and updated on our computer. So we tell you that homework tonight, work with your upline, give you access, get it done. Because when I start on Tuesday, I can't help you download anything. I, I can't. I just don't have the time. There's 25 of you in here. I've got to go through a lot of information on eApp and underwriting. So that's part of your homework. The other part of your homework is your A1. Make sure you know that tight. You should be able to look at me in the camera and give me your spiel. And what is the other part of our homework, Melissa, before you answer your question, what other homework do we have as a class? I'm asking you, Melissa, what other homework oh, do we sorry. have as a class? <laughs> to, get our, to get with our, our, I don't know what the person is yet because I haven't met with them. So to get with oh, our that's not homework. That's not homework, oh. but you should be meeting with them, okay. absolutely. Um, what other homework do we our, have? Study our script, our, study the, the whole script. Yeah, start to become familiar with the, the whole script. Practice it, look in front of the mirror, talk it through, say it out loud, however you want to do it. Work with one of your classmates here. You got to get comfortable with that script. And remember, it's a map, so as long as you can follow the map, even if you add some additional words, you're going to be fine. All right, Melissa, what's your question? Um, I'm just going to quick share, so I can't share my screen, but I downloaded what I thought was the e, the the app that you wanted us to install, and I was just looking at it, and I installed the wrong one. And so I just wanted to see if the one that I have now is the correct one to make sure that I'm prepared for you next week. <laughs> so where did you download the app from? Well, Google Play. Nope. So the e-app is not available outside of American income. Okay. So in order, so that's why you got to get with your upline because okay. you have to go to the website aws.planetaltic.com. Okay. And once you're an agent, actually have an agent ID, you'll be able to log in there using your Planet login. If you don't have your agent ID issued. You won't be able to log in there. So you have to get with an agent, ostensibly your upline, who will give you their login so that you can download eApp from that website. And then once you have it downloaded in that website, you are going to log in. And the login is going to be eApp 
training and the passcode is the word training. So I don't want you to use your own login, use that login and that passcode once you have it installed. And the first thing the system will do will update your application because the version that you're downloading is three years old. Okay. And every week we apply an update to that. And okay. if you think about it, anytime a client, I'm sorry, anytime a state changes a form or we change a form for legal reasons, whatever the case may be, we need to update your eApp because eApp has all the forms for all the states that you can sell in. So that every week we make a commitment to the insurance commissioners of every state that no matter when somebody makes a change in terms of the state, we will ensure that our entire workforce has the updated change within one week. So the way we do that is we force you to update your eApp once a week. I'll get with Joe. I'll message him today then and make sure. Joe, he... Joe who? Tini? Yeah. Uh, okay. And you haven't worked with him because your situation is unique, right? Yeah, because okay. yeah, because I'm still waiting. I'm trying to get my health health and accidental license still. Okay. Yeah, we'll definitely get a, hold of Joe, get a hold of Joe so you can download it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Any other homework, Melissa, that this class has? Da, na, 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 na. <laughs> no. Come on, Melissa. Is no. there anything? Else? No. Show up on time tomorrow and be energetic. Whew, that's good because I wasn't going to give you more homework, but if you were, <laughs> I'd be okay, I support it. Everybody, it's been my pleasure today to spend almost four hours with you. As always, I stick around for any questions that you might have. Otherwise, if not, I will see you tomorrow at 9 a.m. Eastern. Every no. I will see you tomorrow at 9 a.m. Pacific time. Everybody have a great day. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Likewise. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. Take care. Bye.